folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All the momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Thursday, June 29, 2023, coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network, live from New Orleans. The Supreme Court strikes down affirmative action in the colleges. We have complete coverage. President Joe Biden weighs in, slams a decision. Vice President Kamala Harris, she was here speaking at the Global Economic Black Forum. We'll have her comments as well. Plus, uh, we have a number of black legal scholars also giving their thoughts on today's decision. We'll also talk about uh, the back and forth uh, between uh, Clarence Thomas and Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. They went at each other in their various opinions. And also, why is it the Supreme Court ruling affirmative action unconstitutional in colleges, but they're allowing the military academies to still use it? If it's constitutional for them, why not the rest of the country? We'll unpack all of that right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. It's time to bring the funk. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. All right, folks, uh, today's Supreme Court decision uh, dealing with affirmative action in colleges, uh, we expected today's decision, uh, but still, the 6-3 decision, the conservatives on the Supreme Court ruled that uh, in two cases involving Harvard as well as University of North Carolina, uh, striking down the use of race in college admissions. Uh, this was Christmas Day, if you will, uh, for Clarence Thomas. He's been waiting for this moment. And man, the, the, uh, the opinions between him and Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson were absolutely on fire. Uh, joining us right now, Dr. Walter Kimbrough. He's a member of president, the President's Advisory Board on HBCUs. He's a past president at Flanders Smith College and Dillard University. Damon Hewitt, president and executive director, Lawrence Committee for Civil Rights Under Law out of D.C. We also have Dr. Jeremy Levitt, distinguished professor of international law, Florida A&M University College of Law, and uh, uh, Tiffany, Brewster, T Tiffany Brewer, assistant professor of law at Howard University. I, I want to start with you, Damon. Uh, walk us through 
uh, this decision. It was one, again, that uh, we have long been expecting. We knew how this conservative Supreme Court uh, was going to rule. What, is the, what did they actually say with regards to Harvard, University of North Carolina, and what is going to be the impact on other institutions all across the country? Well, Roland, look, first, this court has struck down the admissions policies at both of the schools, but it did so in a very strange way. It obviously did not fully affirm precedent, but it also did not outright overrule all precedent. It actually underruled the precedent. It basically took the law and put it in a knot, in some kind of presso, and said, here, figure this out, y'all. Uh, essentially, this court has essentially said, look, we're going to apply Grutter as if it's still good law, but these policies didn't adhere to Grutter. Now, if the UNC policy and the Harvard policy did not adhere to Grutter, then the question remains, what really does? So it's really intellectually dishonest, which is one of the worst things you could ever say about a Supreme Court decision. It doesn't make a lot of sense in law, in fact, or in history. And this is where I'm confused, because there was a very strange footnote in this decision uh, whether if they say the United States, uh, as an amicus curiae, contends that race-based admissions programs further compelling interests at our nation's military academies. No military academy is a party to these cases, however, and none of the courts below address the propriety of race-based admission systems in that context. This opinion also does not address the issue in light of the potentially distinct interest that military academies may, may present. Okay, now I'm confused. So, how can you make a constitutional decision but say there's a compelling interest for diversity in our military academies, but for the rest of the colleges and universities, we're good? I'm well, confused. That's what I mean by intellectually dishonest, Roland. I mean, is it may be, this is not an actual ruling on the military academies, but it may be okay to keep our nation safe because it's important, but it's not okay, at least at UNC and Harvard, to promote opportunity for black folks, especially at a school like UNC, you know, a state that enslaved black people, a university created, literally created, the nation's first public school, university, created to educate the children of slave owners that what black folks suffer from Jim Crow and, and continue, even until recently had a Confederate monument on campus. So it's good enough potentially for military, but not for black and brown folks here. Intellectually dishonest. I mean, I will say this though, Roland. Chief Justice Roberts did say that nothing in the opinion prevents universities from asking students about their experiences uh, with respect to race and essentially racism. And so here's the other side of that. There's nothing that stops black and brown students from talking about who you are. So our message to students is flood the market. Tell them exactly who you are all over your essay, all over your application. Let them know who you are. Because the truth is, as much as this court may want it uh, to be the case, nothing can really stop the fact that we are a race-conscious society. And we also are going to have a race-conscious future, no matter what this court decides. Now, um, Ed Blum, a white man who's been against affirmative action for a very long time, he challenged, of course, uh, California state, he led this lawsuit. And, and so you had these Asian American students um, who contend that they should, that they were being discriminated against by Harvard, and more of them should have been admitted to Harvard based upon merit. But here's the problem, Damon. Their problem ain't affirmative action. Their problem is white folks in legacy. And the Supreme Court said nothing about that. Nothing about that at all. Now, look, you know, legacy admissions are kind of like the grandfather clause in voting rights in the days of Jim Crow. If your grandfather could vote, uh, then you can vote too. This is just like saying, well, if your grandparents could attend uh, UNC or, or attend the UNC or Harvard, then you can too. Uh, that's essentially what it is. That, that, there is some structural racism uh, in that very structure to leave that in place. Now, we don't like legacy admissions to begin with, but if all you're left with is something like that without uh, real consideration of race, then you're talking about a whole new type of civil rights violation, a violation against black and brown people whose grandparents and great-great-grandparents were not able to attend these schools, not because they didn't want to, not even because they couldn't afford it, but because they were not allowed to. They were not welcome in these institutions. That is structural racism at its worst. 
Uh, indeed. Damien Hewitt, Law Committee, Pursuit Roger the Law. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Uh, Tiffany, I, I want to go to you. Uh, again, I want to I want to stay on that particular point. Uh, and again, I'm looking at all of these white conservatives, Tiffany, and, and they are, oh, they are ecstatic with today's decision. And I keep responding to them, to the Ben Shapiro, to the Eric Erickson's, to the Charlie Kirk's, to all of them, to the David French's of the world. Why is it y'all are so silent on legacy? Even so Clarence Thomas, in his his um, opinion, he's talking about merit and merit and the merit is the most important thing. We know for a fact that 45 percent of the students at Harvard are in because of legacy or they're athletes. This ain't about uh, merit. And I dare say, Tiffany, these Asian American students who now think that they're going to now uh, have to see an explosion of admissions at Harvard and Yale and all the Ivy League schools because of their SAT scores, nah, they're still going to be impacted by legacy. Yeah. Well, I agree with Damon wholeheartedly when he started the conversation by saying that the decision is intellectually not honest. But we were not surprised by this because the court, you know, over a decade ago was hinting in their decisions that they see that, you know, we were really a, a racially blind uh, society. So we saw this coming. But certainly ignoring legacy admissions and particularly the high rate of legacy admissions at some institutions historically, some of the best institutions historically, completely ignores the very argument argument that the conservatives were seeking to make. And we are not a race-neutral uh, society. We probably never will be because we still have not truly acknowledged uh, and have a debate right now the impact of slavery that we still feel and how it impacts educational systems as well and opportunities for students to even matriculate. You know, we see even in the amicus uh, briefs, uh, even large sectors of corporate society who are our employers, who are the ones that are receiving these students who also agree that diversity is important even in the workplace uh, as, as well. So this decision really uh, cut against even the economic interests of the very economy that it that it you know certainly wants to prop up as well. And we are not going to be better off. I agree with Justice Sot Sonia Sotomayor who said that this in, this has a devastating impact. Uh, that cannot be overstated. So ignoring the impact of legacy admissions is absolutely intellectually dishonest, and it's why the American people are starting to distrust the Supreme Court as an institution as we speak. Um, Jeremy, uh, when, we, when we look at this case, again, you look at these arguments that were being made by... Um, these Asian American students, uh, and it, one, some of them are laughable. Uh, one of these students went on Laura Ingram's show on Fox News a couple of weeks ago and talked about how he applied to Stanford and all of these other schools in California, and he couldn't get in because of affirmative action. Well, we knew that was a lie because they banned affirmative action in, in California schools a long time ago. So what you end up happening here was and let me know if I'm just, if I'm making this way too simple. You got a group of Asian American students and their parents who were pissed off that their kids were not getting into Harvard, Yale, and the Ivy League schools. So they decided to sue. So now what they've done is upend the entire system because a few of them didn't get in and they're blaming it on affirmative action when the very system is what kept them out. Legacy is still in place. The Supreme Court didn't address that. Supreme Court didn't address gender. We know white women have benefited from affirmative action more than anybody else. And so I'm sitting here going, what did you accomplish except screw it up for a lot of other people? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can't disagree with that. There's so much to unpack here. Uh, first of all, the Asian students that filed the claim assumed that they were qualified on all other criteria. So test scores are one criteria, race is one criteria, but often they don't have the same level of public service. 
attachment and engagement with the community and other things that universities look at. So it can be a myriad of things. The assumption here is if you score high, you're being admitted. And that's not always the case. We know that to be true. I've been the dean of a law school. That's not necessarily the case. But this case is dangerous because essentially what it does is it eliminates the compelling government interest and narrow, narrow, narrowly tailored test of, of script scrutiny. So it, it really does override the Gruder case to eliminate the use of race even as a compelling factor in college admissions. And I think you're right to point out here, well, why in the military? Well, I think that's clear. They need brown and black bodies in the military. So they're willing to give an exception for that. So we're, we're available to go to war for America, but not attend its public universities based on our race. We're available to be recruited as five-star athletes to Division One and two schools as black athletes, but, but, but race is not a factor. What if we take race out of the factor for the recruitment of college athletes? Because there has to be a nexus between race and athleticism. If that weren't the case, we wouldn't be filling up the benches of football teams and basketball teams across the country. So race is convenient for them. For me, this is another episode of what I call the kind of lawfare that the Supreme Court has made against African-Americans. We can look at the Dred Scott decision in 1857, uh, where they said that black people weren't citizens of the country and had no rights for which the white man was bound to respect. We can go to Plessy versus uh, Ferguson in 1896 that essentially overrode uh, the 14th Amendment in, in 1868 right, that essentially said that uh, we're going to make it equal, but we're going to make it separate. That is the order of the day until 1954, and between 1954 and the mid-1970s, we fought to desegregate. So there really hasn't been time for us to have the equality of affirmative action that so much of us think is relevant and proper, given the history of discrimination. Um, here's the thing that, I, that uh, is interesting to me also here, uh, Dr. Walter Kimbrough. Um, and that, that, I, that I, as, I, as, I, as I look at this and, and, and look at this ruling uh, and then, then look at this, uh, this whole reaction. Uh, and, and that is, again, so you have the Harvard case, you have the University of North Carolina. Uh, and the Supreme Court now wants to put the onus on the students, how you can, what, what you can bring up uh, and what you can speak to. But what's also fascinating, again, is to hear all of these people keep yelling, merit, merit, merit. And they keep thinking that everything is based upon, well, I had high grades in high school and my test scores. I think about Abigail Fisher, the white girl out of Texas, when she sued uh, the University of Texas because she contended, oh, uh, I didn't get into the University of Texas because affirmative action. Well, what happened during depositions? They discovered that there were a lot of white students who had lower scores than she did but got admitted. And so what always happens here is whether it's Abigail Fisher or these Asian-American students, it becomes, oh, I didn't get in, so it must be the black and brown people. More of them were getting in when it was like, no, a bunch of white students got in over you. That's literally what we keep seeing in these cases. No, absolutely. It's, it's the same uh you know, the black guy did it. I'm thinking about what, what Jeremy was talking about. You know, my mom went to the University of California at Berkeley, and I remember reading one of their magazines a few years ago. And one of the concerns that people had is that if they strictly admitted students based on those qualitative scores, the University of California at Berkeley would, would be heavily Asian. And so people are uncomfortable with that. And so they really have been depressing even that at level of enrollment, and no one's complaining about that. And so how do they depress it with the legacies and all these other things? Like Jeremy said, the athletes, I mean, if we're just going to use admission criteria, let's use it for the athlete. Let them meet the same level of admission requirement. But we look at athletics as a special quality that they're bringing to the institution, and people get excited about that. So it, black and brown students have always been the easy target to say, well, it must be their fault when actually it's not their fault. And when you, like you said earlier, when you start looking at legacies, the major donors, those are the people that are impacted. And some of these institutions don't want to look like, you know, Berkeley doesn't want to be 70% Asian. And so they are depressing those numbers. And you can't blame the black folks there because they're still three to 5% of the population. So you could take all the black folks out. That doesn't change it. And that's a deeper conversation that people have to have. 
Uh, folks, hold tight one second. Got to go to break. We come back. Uh, we have more conversation about uh, today's decision. We'll hear from uh, President Joe Biden, hear from Vice President Kamala Harris. All of that as we continue our discussion about this Supreme Court decision uh, banning the use of race in college admissions today and announcing a 6-3 decision. We'll discuss more right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're we about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye -bye, bye -bye. live from LA and this is the culture the culture is a two-way conversation you and me we talk about the stories politics the good the bad and the downright ugly so join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard hey we're all in this together so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into it's the culture weekdays at 3 only on the Black Star Network Hi, everybody. I'm Kim Coles. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. Yo, it's your man Dion Cole from Blackish, and you watch Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, um, we're back on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, it was immediate reaction across the political spectrum uh, today when the Supreme Court decision came down. Here is uh, what President Joe Biden had to say about today's ruling. 45 years, or 45 years, the United States Supreme Court has recognized the college's freedom to decide how, how to build diverse student bodies and to meet the responsibility of opening doors of opportunity for every single American. <clears throat> in case after case, including recently, uh, just as a few years ago in 2016, the court has affirmed and reaffirmed this view, that colleges could use race not as a determinant factor for admission, but as one of the factors among many in deciding who to admit from a, quali from a qualified, already qualified pool of applicants. Today, the court once again walked away from decades of precedent and make, as the dissent has made clear. The dissent states in today's decision, quote, rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress, end of quote. I agree with that statement from the dissent from the dissent. <clears throat> the court has effectively ended affirmative action in college admissions. And I strongly, strongly disagree with the court's decision. Because affirmative action is so misunderstood, I want to be clear, make sure everybody's clear about what the law has been and what it has not been until today. Many people wrongly believe that affirmative action allows unqualified students, unqualified students to be admitted ahead of qualified students. This is not this is not how college admissions work. Rather, colleges set out standards for admission. And every student, every student has to meet those standards. Then and only then, after first meeting the qualifications required by the school, do college look at other factors in addition to their grades, such as race. The way it works in practice is this. Colleges first establish a qualified pool of candidates based on meeting a certain grade, test scores and other criteria. Then and only then, then and only then, it is from this pool of applicants, all of whom have already met the school standards, that the class is chosen 
after weighing a wide range of factors, among them being race. You know, I've always believed that one of the greatest threats of America, and you're tired of hearing me say it, is our diversity. But I believe that. If you have any doubt about this, just look at the United States military. The finest fighting force in the history of the world. It's been a model of diversity. And it's not only been our, made our nation better, stronger, but safer. I believe the same is true for our schools. I've always believed that the promise of America is big enough for everyone to succeed, and that every generation of Americans, we have benefited by opening the doors of opportunity just a little bit wider to include those who have been left behind. I believe our colleges are stronger when they are racially diverse. Our nation is stronger because we use what we, because we are tapping into the full range of talent in this nation. I also believe that while talent, creativity, and hard work are everywhere across this country, not equal opportunity. It is not everywhere across this country. We cannot let this decision be the last word. One emphasis, we cannot let this decision be the last word. While the court can render a decision, it cannot change what America stands for. America is an idea, an idea unique in the world, an idea of hope, an opportunity, of possibilities, of giving everyone a fair shot, of leaving no one behind. We've never fully lived up to it, but we've never walked away from it either. We will not walk away from it now. We should never allow the country to walk away from the dream upon which it was founded. That opportunity is for everyone, not just a few. We need a new path forward, a path consistent with a law that protects diversity and expands opportunity. So today I want to offer some guidance to our nation's colleges as they review their admission systems after today's decision. Guidance that is consistent with today's decision. They should not abandon, let me say this again, they should not abandon their commitment to ensure student bodies of diverse backgrounds and experience that reflect all of America. What I propose for consideration is a new standard, where colleges take into account the adversity a student has overcome when selecting among qualified applicants. Let's be clear. Under this new standard, just as was true under the earlier standard, Students first have to be qualified applicants. They need the GPA and test scores to meet the school's standards. Once that test is met, then adversity should be considered, including, including lack, a students' lack of financial means, because we know too few students of low-income families, whether in big cities or rural communities, are getting an opportunity to go to college. When the poor kid, when a poor kid, maybe the first in their family to go to college, gets the same grades and test scores as a wealthy kid, his whole family's gone to the most elite colleges in the country, and his path has been a lot easier. Well, the kid who faced tougher challenges has demonstrated more grit, more determination, and that should be a factor that colleges should take into account in admissions, and many still do. It also means examining where a student grew up and went to high school. It means understanding the particular hardships that each individual student has faced in life, including racial discrimination that individuals have faced in their own lives. The court says, quote, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an application's discussion of how race has affected his or her life, but it's, it's through, but be it through discrimination or inspiration or otherwise, end of quote. Because the truth is, we all know it, discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Today's decision does not change that. It's a simple fact. If a student has, has overcome, had to overcome adversity on their path to education, college should recognize and value that. Our nation, colleges, and universities should be engines of expanding opportunity through upper mobility. But today, too often, that's not the case. Statistics, one, one statistic. Students from the top 1% of family incomes in America are 77 times more likely to get into elite college than one from the bottom 20% of family incomes. 77% greater opportunity. Today, for too many schools, the only people who benefit from the system are the wealthy and the well-connected. The odds have been stacked against working people for much too long. We need a higher education system that works for everyone. From, from Appalachia to Atlanta and to far beyond. 
We can and must do better, and we will. Today, I'm directing the Department of Education to analyze what practices help build a more inclusive and diverse student bodies and what practices hold that back. Practices like legacy admissions and other systems <coughs> expand privilege instead of opportunity. Colleges and universities should continue their commitment to support, retain, and graduate the first students and classes. You know, and companies, companies who are already realizing the value of diversity should not use this decision as an excuse to turn away from diversity either. <coughs> we can't go backwards. <coughs> you know, I know today's court decision is a severe disappointment to so many people, including me. But we cannot let the decision be a permanent setback for the country. We need to keep an open door of opportunities. We need to remember that diversity is our strength. <coughs> we have to find a way forward. We need to remember that the promise of America is big enough for everyone to succeed. You know, that's the work of my administration, and I'm always going to fight for that. Folks, well, joining our panel, Dr. Greg Carr, Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. Uh, glad to have you here, uh, Dr. Carr. Uh, you're coming to us live from Atlanta. You uh, heard what President Biden had to say. In, in next, after the next break, we're going to play what Vice President Kamala Harris had to say here in New Orleans. Uh, and he talked about this guidance given. Uh, the, the fact of the matter we know is this. Even with all of its problems, the reality is the use of affirmative action, not only in college admissions, has been one of the most successful ways in which uh, to bring people of color, black folks and others, uh, into this system, to take advantage of uh, economic opportunities, educational opportunities. I talked about this in my book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. They have been going after this because they knew what was coming down the line. They knew America was, be was gonna become a, a day one day where white folks were not in the majority. And what you have here are people who are so angry uh, for even a sliver uh, of an advancement by black folks and others that they want to say, oh, no, let's, let's, let, let, let's be race neutral, except in the things that still benefit them where they know it's not race neutral. Absolutely. Well, race neutrality, race neutrality as we know, doesn't exist, certainly in the, legal, the American legal universe. When we say race neutral or colorblind, what you mean is preserving whiteness. Today, the Supreme Court of the United States continued to be very consistent since the federal constitution was uh, passed and ratified in 1787. Today, the Supreme Court of the United States reaffirmed that standing for whiteness is a central element of U.S. constitutional law. That's it, full stop. My concern is how we read that. We know that white women have been the primary beneficiaries of, of affirmative action. Uh, we know that you know, most of us are not going to Harvard or Yale. I mean, Harvard Yale go to hell as far as I'm concerned. I, had, I never aspired to go there when they tried to get me to apply. When I was at Tennessee State, I had no interest. Um, what we're really talking about is a system in place in this country where the elite, and by the elite, I mean the financially elite, the economically, like Ed Bloom, who basically made up a, 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 a Trojan horse in the form of Asian Americans, because Asian American undergraduates at Harvard stood with the non-white students, quite frankly, most of them anyway, and uh, used it as a point of entry to try to reinforce in this radically unequal country protections for the very elite. Ketanji Brown Jackson in orals, and by the way, congratulations, uh, of course, to KBJ, because she, unlike uh, Alito and uh, Alito and Thomas, has morals and recused herself from the Harvard case, but did write uh, in dissent uh, for the, the North Carolina case. During the orals, she asked, so if a student applies, I'm sure y'all probably have talked about this, but if a student applies and writes in her his admissions statement, the impact of being a fifth generation uh, person applying at the University of North Carolina. In other words, writes about legacy. Is that allowed? The lawyer said yes. And then she said, but if another student writes and talks about being the first in her generation to be able to apply because of segregation, can she write that? And the answer was, almost sounded like Tim Scott talking. <laughs> so what we're really talking about is protections for whiteness. And the deeper question, as far as I'm concerned, as black people are concerned, is why? You know, why do we mistake the advancement of a handful of folk into the economic elite as a proxy for the advancement of all of us? As you say, I'm in Atlanta right now. The future of higher education, it seems to me, should look a lot closer to Georgia State University. Over 30,000 students, about 40% black, 
about maybe 27 shy, just shy of 28% white. And Walter knows what I'm talking about. President Kimball knows what I'm talking about. Uh, double digits in Asian and Latino, black president, and access to resources. The whole idea is we have to expand the concept of higher education. While you're talking about your, your mom with Cal Berkeley, once they got that referendum in and put that race cannot be included as a factor in policymaking in the state of California, the law school at Berkeley, Boat Hall, cratered in terms of the number of black people. Now, my question is, why in the hell are you aspiring to that as your standard and model for excellence in the first place? This is the point. I don't, I'm not celebrating today, but I'm damn sure not nearly as worried about this as a lot of people who simply haven't thought through the impact of stigmatized blackness and aspiring to proximity to these elite spaces as some kind of proxy for advancement for the race. This is the deeper question that this case invites us to have to have conversation in in the black community. Well, Tiffany, I think that when, as how I saw this here, I mean, let's just, and again, I'm not sitting here attacking the students or the parents, but I look at, I go back to these, these exclusive schools in New York City. Uh, when uh, the mayor, the previous mayor tried to make changes to them. And there was a lot of Asian American parents who were like, how dare you? Because they're children. So what did you have? You had this insistence on high grades and high scores in the hiring of tutors. And all those different things. In fact, I'm going to read what uh, uh, first, former First Lady Michelle Obama had to say about that because she addressed that very issue. Uh, and so what you have here, so to Greg's point, wh why, why are these students so insistent? Because they understand that the elite schools, every single one of those Supreme Court justices, where do they go? Where do the folks in Washington, D.C. look to hire uh, with all those same Supreme Court justices, hire clerks? For all of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and how wonderful she was and how liberal she was, how many black clerks does she have? Are they choosing clerks from HBCU law schools? No, they're not. And so really what we're talking about, the reason there is this fight, uh, and I see you over there laughing, Jeremy, the reason you have this fight over here, because the reality is this nation... Republicans and Democrats, they believe in the elite institutions. This is what this system is all about. And that's what these folks are trying. That's why when you see, like, it pisses me off when I see these videos uh, and people go, oh, my God, so-and-so, the black kid, got into Harvard. And I'm going, okay, that's great. And, and again, for me, I don't, I don't, you know, like, I get it, but I'm not tripping because... I'm going, wait a minute, so I should be excited because a black kid got to Harvard, but not be excited if a black kid got to Howard? That, that, that literally is what we talk about, what is being created. Tiffany, go ahead. Well, I think we should be excited about both. Rolling, really, because it comes down to also uh, uh, autonomy of how... Oh, oh, oh let me be real clear. I'm excited I'm excited at Harvard. I'm, Tiffany, I'm excited right. when they get into Harvard, <laughs> when they get into Howard, when they get, in this, uh, when they get to uh, Kennedy King College, the city college in right. Chicago. See, I'm excited about all of them, but, the, but what, I, what I don't like is when we as black folks, we, when we say, oh, getting into, into Harvard is bigger than getting into Harvard, that plays into white validation. Absolutely, and we have to reject that. Um, and we have to have enough pride in, in the messaging that we have about the value of historically black colleges in particular, and even look historically at how they were founded and how our ancestor did, ancestors did so much with so little, and are we even fulfilling uh, that responsibility and legacy? But, you know, we cannot equate the, the access to elite institutions as validation of our ability to succeed. So I, I, I don't want this decision to be, you know, certainly interpreted that um, we, we uh, can't aspire to these uh, elite institutions or that now everyone has to go to HBCU. But what if everyone did go to an HBCU? You talked about the athletes earlier. What if the athletes, you know, who who perpetuate some of these institutions that do not consider race, what if they went to HBCUs? I, I wonder financially if some of those institutions would truly survive. So I do think it is important for us to really peel down and understand even in how we move forward from this decision. As Dr. Carr alluded, it's not just a doom 
doomsday, but it is a challenge for us and our community to think about our, our messaging. You know, I, I went to a predominantly white institution. Uh, my husband went to Morehouse. And as we talked more and more, I'm like, I should have gone, you, you know. Um, but you you talked about why. Uh, but, I, you know, I was listening to, I knew I wanted to go to law school. So I'm listening to and looking at all the Supreme Court justices that went to certain institutions. These are messages that do get filtered down to our young people, but we have to reverse that. And I do think decisions like this today make it even clearer for us who are leaders in empowering and educating black minds, whether at an HBCU or in our own homes and families, to really look historically at, at what we have been able to achieve uh, as black people in this society and to look at the institutions that will further that as well. Um, and one thing we haven't, you know, really talked about, we talked about how white women have been the largest beneficiaries of affirmative action. But when we really look at the impact of this decision moving forward also on black women, who, when we look at an intersectional analysis of, of how black women have been faring, you know, in the profession of law, you know, in other professions, I think this type of decision can have devastating impacts on black women's uh, advancement as, as well, in a very disproportionate way than it would clearly have uh, on white women. And, you know, I thought the decision was also very interesting in uh, the court really completely rejected all of the justifications that both schools had with respect to what the benefits are and the goals that they have in, in serving uh, diversity as an interest. And the court essentially said that none of them really fit into uh, the strict, strict scrutiny analysis and they couldn't even measure them. So it's like they are just rejecting altogether the value of diversity. And to reject that means you are rejecting that there is a disparate impact that that history has had on underrepresented people. And who's impacted the most by disregarding that is black people in the United States, because we have a new, unique history of the impact of slavery and the continued impact of systemic discrimination. And this is another furtherance of systemic discrimination in our society, unfortunately. Okay, once uh, hold on one second. Going to a quick break. Two minutes. I'll be right back, uh, and we'll continue the conversation. We'll hear from Vice President Kamala Harris. We'll also uh, read for you the statement from Michelle Obama. Uh, and also, I'm going to play for you. 2004, I specifically questioned President George W. Bush about affirmative action and about legacy. Wait till I play that for you. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also support us by uh, joining our Brina Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to cover the stories that we do every single day. Trust me, this conversation that we're having right here with our with black uh, education and legal minds ain't happening in the mainstream media. It ain't happening in the black owned media. It is only happening right here. So. Please support us with check and money orders. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. My early days on the road, I've learned, well, first of all, as a musician, uh, I studied not only uh, piano, but I was also drummer and percussion. I was all city percussion as well. So I was one of the best in the city on percussion. There you go. Also studied uh, trumpet, uh, cello, violin, and bass, and any other instrument I could get my hand mm -hmm. on. And, and, and with that study, I learned again what was for me. I learned to what, what it meant to do what the 
instruments in the orchestra meant to each other in the relationships. Right. So that prepared me to be a leader, that prepared me to lead orchestras and to conduct orchestras, that prepared me to know, uh, to be a leader of men, they have to respect you and know that you know the music. You have to be the teacher of the music. You have to know the music better than anybody. There you go. Right, so you can't walk in unprepared. next on The Frequency with me, Dee Barnes. She's known as the Angela Davis of hip hop, Monet Smith, better known as Medusa, the gangster goddess, the undisputed queen of West Coast underground hip hop. Pop locking is really what indoctrinated me in hip hop. Mm. I don't think, I don't even think I realized it was hip hop at that time. Right. You know, it was a, it was a, a happening. Mm -hmm. It was a moment of release. We're going to be getting into her career, knowing her whole story and breaking down all the elements of hip hop. This week on The Frequency, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from LA. And this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey. We're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's the culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Marissa Mitchell, a news anchor at Fox 5 DC. Hey, what's up? It's Sammy Roman, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Folks, I'm here in New Orleans for Essence Festival 2023, and that was a global black economic forum sponsored by Essence Ventures. Vice President Kamala Harris uh, was uh, speaking. Before she made her remarks, uh, she did address this Supreme Court decision. I prepared to have a very long conversation with you about many other matters, yes. and then the highest court in our land just made a decision today on affirmative action, and I, I feel compelled to speak about it. Um, and I'm sure that I share the sentiment and the feeling of everyone in this room in terms of the deep um, disappointment. I, I encourage everyone, by the way, to read uh, the, the dissenting opinion of Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I encourage you to read it because she is a beautiful writer who is compelled by logic and a knowledge of history and a clarity of thinking about where we have been in as a country and where we have the potential to go. Mm -hmm. And what she so rightly has articulated, as I take away from her writing and the way I feel about it, is the disappointment is because this is now a moment where the court has not fully understand the importance of equal opportunity for the people of our country. And it is in so very many ways a denial of opportunity. And the, the, it is a complete misnomer to suggest this is about colorblind, when in fact it is about being blind to history being blind to data, being blind to empirical evidence about disparities, being blind to the strength that diversity brings to classrooms, right. to boardrooms. That's right. So I, I did, Tishana, I thank you for giving me um, this moment to just speak on that. And I think that there is no question, we have so much work to do and um, the president spoke so eloquently earlier today about this. Our administration will use all the tools in our power to continue to applaud 
policies that understand the importance and the significance and the strength of diversity in all of those places. And one of the points that the president also made is, is the point of encouraging our educational institutions to now be very about how they will prioritize the importance of diversity, including looking at students' backgrounds in terms of find access to financial strength and benefits, um, where they went to high school, where they grew up. Um, and also the president, I thought, was very clear about saying to corporate America mm -hmm. that we would expect that this decision will not in any way cloud their judgment about the importance of diversity in the workplace. Absolutely. One of the things uh, I, I want to talk about, panel. I mean, look, we've got someone from Florida a University, Howard University, uh, two folks from Howard University, and of course, uh, former president of two HBCUs. I've been seeing a lot of uh, folk talk, uh, Jeremy, about, oh my goodness, this is now going to be a boon for HBCUs. Um, when you hear that, your thoughts? I'm not so sure. Um, I think it's possible. Uh, that uh, those students that would otherwise, you know, get rejected if race is not a factor could decide to uh, attend HBCUs. But I, that might be some false logic. The math doesn't really equal that in my mind. Um, you know, I, I think the case sends a strong message that, that we can build uh, predominantly white universities with our labor under an edict of the Supreme Court as enslaved people, but we can't attend them. And, and, and so we're at, a, I think, a, a critical juncture, but not a critical juncture in the way people might think. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're past the time where we got to start thinking out of the box. For example, um, why don't we have HBCUs in the northern part of the country? Why don't we have private HBCUs in the northern part of the country? Are we thinking out of the box about, about the kind of educational institutions we need to create? Uh, how do we reinforce existing HBCUs and make sure that they're on target fiscally and having the right academic programs to educate our people? Listen, I, I didn't want to attend Harvard. I wanted to know what Harvard's daddy thought. So I went to Cambridge in England, and I learned a whole lot about Harvard and Yale in doing that, right? So, so the idea is that teaching at an HBCU, for me, um, is, is enriching because I have a multitude of diversity. We often don't think of HBCUs uh, as diverse, uh, but they are probably the most diverse institutions in America. We have whites and Latinos and every other group there, as, as the panelists know. Um, and so I, I wouldn't get too uh, caught up in some of the rhetoric about that. What, what I would do, though, is say that we have to start thinking strategically about a court that has made lawfare against us for 400 years, a court that has systematically discriminated against us, a court that has not given us any breathing room in affirmative action to rebuild uh, and repair the damage that has been done. And so we can't count on the court, and we really can't count on governmental institutions. This has been in the making for a while. If we go back to the prior decision mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the Fisher case, and look at the dicta of, of uh, Justice Scalia. Uh, Justice Scalia made it very clear Right, almost as a as 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 a pretext to this case that black maybe blacks are too inferior to attend elite white universities. Maybe they should go attend HBCUs. Mm -hmm. So 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 the logic of this has been a part of the thinking in this system for a long time. We've just arrived now at a critical juncture where we were always supposed to be. Right, I think I think there's been a, a myth of white education and what going to predominantly white institutions does for African Americans. And in fact, we destroy a lot of our young people in these institutions, quite frankly. So I think we have to start thinking out of the box so that we can conceive of a new paradox in education for ourselves and quit always reacting to white, what white people do and don't do in terms of the structural racism that, that they pronounce upon us. Um, Walter, um, it, it is... I, what I have been trying to lay out to people for quite some time is, especially black people and conscious white people, is to understand the, the assault that is taking place. So, for instance, um, Byron Donalds, congressman from Florida, he wrote, wrote some little silly tweet that literally made no sense. Some other people talked about how, oh, this is now an attack on woke. And I, and I need people to understand 
that this Supreme Court decision, first of all, was tailor-made in terms of how Ed Bloom filed it for the conservative Federalist Society Supreme Court justices. They thought that independent state legislature theory was going to fly. They got three votes. Didn't get five, but they got three. You look at CRT. What I keep saying is they're going after any diversity initiative in corporate America. You already see how they attack Bud Light and Target when it came to transgender, when it came to LGBT. So what people need to under, what black folks need to understand is that the assault that they are waging, this battle, this war, is not limited to education. They have seen how effective it has been and they want to slow it down and get rid of it to make it more harder for the next 50 years. And we should be much more fortified for the battle at hand. No, I, I mean, I definitely agree. Um, I think this is a larger attack on pretty much everything black and they're looking to do that wrote an op-ed for the AJC a few months ago when they were doing some of those kinds of things led by the lieutenant governor and basically I just said he just didn't like anything black and so we're seeing a lot of that um, you know I'm, I'm thinking about um, what Jeremy is mentioning in terms of you know what this means for HBCUs I mean I think there's going to be a range of people I think that you will see some more interest from some folks because they're going to realize first of all what they did was get all the the diversity offices so if you get to one of these campuses you're not going to have any support and now a lot of students who are making decisions will realize that there will be fewer black students uh, in years to come I, I'm in an interesting position because I have a rising senior who is now going through that process. And so now she has to factor in different places to say, what is it going to look like in a year? Because the number of students that they have now won't be the same. And so I think that there has been this overall attack and people are saying, what's going to be next? Um, but I, I mean, I keep thinking about this in the broader higher ed concept and particularly with, with HBCUs. Um, since I knew Brother Carr would be on here, I had to pull out a little history because I think he's going to appreciate this. And this is a Howard reference as well. 95 years ago, Mordecai Wyatt Johnson did a report for the YMCA. And he talked about, and this is where we are right now. He, he, he writes, he says, Negroes must do a contradictory thing. They must work with all their might against segregation and at the same time strengthen their so-called segregated institutions as if they expected them to last forever. They must insist that the doors of Harvard and Yale be kept open to Negroes and at the same time build up Howard and Lincoln as if there were no Harvard or Yale. And I think that's sort of where we are. That's what we saw today is that there are going to be people fighting because I think we need those opportunities as well. And we can't let this be the first salvo in attacks on everything black, which people are doing. But at the same time, we've got to figure out how do we even strengthen our institutions? And as Brother Carr said, how do we have deeper conversations in our communities about strengthening our institutions and what we do? I think that is very important. Yeah. And, 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 and that, is a, that is a critical point uh, there, uh, Greg. Uh, I, I think back to Gerald Horn's book on Claude Bournet uh, and the Associated Negro Press and what he's called the Jim Crow Paradox that for every at every moment when we are knocking down the walls of Jim Crow, we're putting a nail in the coffin of, of, of black institutions. Uh, and we've seen that when it came to black economics, black owned media, uh, and, and, and as a result. But one of the things that I have been trying to also remind people when we talk about, uh, when I see all the people commenting about, oh, what this could mean for HBCUs. Well, just look at the last five years, especially after the death of George Floyd in 2020. In the last five years, uh, we've seen a tremendous increase uh, of students applying uh, at HBCUs. Well, here's one of the issues. If you don't have the infrastructure, you got to be able to keep up. And so we see at Texas Southern University, Howard, Tennessee State, multiple Florida A&M, having to put students in hotel rooms. Uh, and so then, then somebody tweeted me back. They said, yeah, but if they get more students, they need more money. I'm like, no, no, no. I said, you need the infrastructure now. You can't w like wait till they show up and then go, oh, here's an influx of money. And I said, no, you have to be prepared for that. Uh, and so a peop and so to, so to uh, Walter's point, this has to be a conversation of how, how are we building up institutions because the numbers are the numbers. 237,000 students go to HBCUs. 
There are 1.6 million black students who go to PWIs. If 10% of all black students at PWIs decide tomorrow to go to HBCUs, they literally cannot handle that infrastructure. And so we have to understand infrastructure and capacity if we're talking about people love to say, man, build, use our own, build our own. Yeah, but you, if you don't understand what building means, that's just a whole bunch of words coming together. Sure. Hey, Roland, I have to echo Brother uh, Levitt. Prof, you're right. Um, the HBC classification is a strict one based on history and experience, as we know. But I would count Mega Everest in Brooklyn. I would count Chicago State in Chicago. You say Kennedy King. Uh, there are a number of schools, community colleges, Philadelphia. All those things, all those were spaces where our people can get a quality education. Now, we also have to factor in the fact that higher education has been completely disrupted. So, you know, with the emergence of online learning and then COVID disrupting things, the price point is way too damn high. I wouldn't be caught dead in Oxford, Cambridge, or Harvard. And, you know, Prof, I hope you appreciate that, especially since you're a fan you where my old professor from Ohio State, the word Purnell, spent many years after he left Ohio State. So I know you appreciate yes. that, but I give a damn about Susan Rhodes and his mama. But the point is this. The point I'm about to make is this. We, and this is why the Black Star Network is so important, we're not going to have this conversation anywhere else, but we need to have this conversation. When you read Clarence Thomas's concurrence, where he says that Gratz was, was not decided correctly, that uh, that Fisher was not decided correctly. And if you remember the oral arguments where uh, Scalia, Scalia was raising that very point you raised, Roland, and then died before he could write, died in the lodge where one of his billionaire friends had put him up for the night, the arguments they're making are arguments we need an answer for. Let me just be very clear about this. We start about strict scrutiny. We start talking about whether a, a, a policy uh, achieves a compelling state interest and whether it's narrowly tailored. When you read Clarence Thomas, when you read Clarence Thomas's concurrence, we don't have an answer for that. When he says, "What is the compelling state interest?" Because when I'm looking at this from a class perspective, is it really uh, benefiting black people when you get black elites at Harvard and it ain't the black masses? And when you t is that a compelling state interest? And when you start talking about being narrowly tailored. What are you using as a proxy for diversity beyond just demographics? I hear the vice president talking about data, but what does the data tell us about class? Why am I raising this? Not because I'm supporting Clarence Thomas. What I'm saying is we haven't had a conversation about this, quite frankly. And when you read that concurrence and he's saying, you know, all this stuff about how this is, this, I can't measure the progress. When we start talking about diversity, you understand that the 14th Amendment, as Katani Brown Jackson continues to remind people, did not preclude race-based race -based remedies. And the only time we started talking about affirmative action as being about diversity was after Baki. And we use this as if we're reading the Bible. But in fact, going back to what you raised, uh, President Kim, Brother, Brother Walter, when Mordecai Johnson said that, we were trapped behind the hedge of apartheid. There was no, cla there was no class differentiation that could prevent the black elite from escaping. But because of those victories, from Brown after, the black elite started getting the hell away from the black masses. You know who else never hired a clerk from an HBCU? Thurgood Marshall. The point is that if the benefit for affirmative action was just going to benefit the black elite, well then damn it, I don't care. I'm saying that, and we use HBCUs as the, as the kind of proxy for black higher education and exclude all the community colleges where our people are, which include California, which include Mississippi Hines Community College, which include, as you say, Kennedy King and all these other places in, in the federal uh, colleges of, of Chicago. Then what we are saying is that our value, our valuation of what it means to be black and move together in this country, really what we're talking about is we just want to develop the black bourgeoisie and use us as some kind of proxy for advancement of the race. And I'm telling you right now, at a time when the white bourgeoisie is turning away from higher education and it's being disrupted, we're going to be left holding the bag in a conversation that if we don't have it now, and I, but, but when I say we don't have it now, what I'm saying is when you read this 237 pages, what you're going to discover is nothing in it that's going to address these issues that we are raising that we don't have answers for, that this white nationalist majority is being able to use to reinforce whiteness. And our response is, but let us in. That's not enough, man. I, I do want to throw this out. Uh, and, and look, I got the four of you here uh, and I was in a group chat and we were we were talking about this here. 
So, all right. So, uh, and we, I think we've already seen this. So, let's say you, you do see this explosion on HBCU campuses. Well, aren't we also going to see that even the HBCUs are going to become more selective as to who they're letting in? And so, what then happens to those black students who are not, frankly, the upper <laughs> echelon of black students. I mean, we, we, we're we going to have to grapple with how are we educating folk who are not the best of the best, not in the top right. 10%, not the, t not the talented 10th. How do we deal with, again, the individuals uh, who, you know, they weren't 3.8, 3.9, 4.5, 5.0 or whatever, but there have been people who have gone on and gone on to do great things because they simply got a shot. Uh, we yeah. just would love to hear your perspective. Let me, and I want to hear first from the former president of two HBCUs first, uh, because that could be a by, because we're actually even seeing that right now, Walter. Yeah, I, but, you know, I think there's always been a range of institutions. So HBCUs aren't a monolith. Um, you know, I was president of two institutions. Dillard would be a part of that group that we call the Black Ivy League, and that's with the Howard and Hampton and Morehouse's film. And Philander Smith was not that, and it really served these sort of low-income folks from, from Arkansas that were really sharp. But Philander Smith was a place that produced Jocelyn Elders and James Cone, father of Black liberation theology, and his brother Cecil Wayne Cone, and Robert Williams, a father of Black psychology. So there's always been a place. So I, I agree with you. I don't think everyone, and just based on my experience, I don't think everyone will rush toward that. The, the challenge, I think, for some to rush toward that is that when you get these outside pressures saying, well, you're not doing a good job because your students don't graduate at a certain level. And those graduation rates, a lot of times, are determined by socioeconomic status. So you have a lot of Pell Grant eligible students, your graduation rate is lower. That's just part of it. But it doesn't mean that those places in these small towns aren't doing a good job. So there's, I think there's always going to be a place. And there will always be HBCUs that say, we are not trying to chase the status. But there, there will be some that have that kind of cachet that people look at. And I think that's fine. There's going to be a range. But there's always going to be a place for Howard. And there's going to always be a place for students at Edda Philander Smith that, that's HBCU, very different, but still plays an important role. And I think that, to Brother Carr's point, we can't just be places where we're viewed as, you know, a place where the black bourgeoisie goes. We have to deal with the predominantly black institutions, like he mentions, the Chicago State, the community college in, the, in the Alabama now. Those kinds of, all of that, I think, is part of it as well. Um, so that's, that's the way I would, I think there's going to always be that range. And I, I just, based on my experience, I don't think everybody is going to try to rush toward that kind of say, how do we get better? A lot of people just trying to get students right now to keep the doors open. So they're just looking for the students. And if this helps drive some of those students there, those students, and actually those students will have a better experience than going to some no-name regional institution that didn't want them anyway. I mean, that's just a fact. That's right. Uh, you know, Tiffany, uh, one of the things that I, I always say uh, when we have these conversations and people are talking about, you know, all these, you know, these elite schools, um, I mean, look, I, and I've had I've had this conversation with black folks who've gone to PWIs and black folks who've gone to HBCUs. Um, I didn't go to HBCU. I graduated from Texas A&M University. Folks say, well, oh, man, well, well a and uh, for journalism, it wasn't Columbia. It wasn't Syracuse. Uh, it wasn't uh, Medill at Northwestern. It wasn't all the rest of these schools. You know what? It's a whole bunch of folk, white, black, and otherwise, who went to all them schools, who spent a whole bunch of money, who not in three Hall of Fames. Yeah. So I make the point, it's, it's not fully a function of, where you went to school. I, I get that whole deal. It's the work you do after you get that sheet of paper. Exactly. And it's also about who will hire you to get not only that first opportunity, but retain you and promote you. And many of those employers were part of the amicus briefs that were saying that 
diversity is something that they want in the workplace and is a part of the productivity that they believe that can happen um, in the world. So it is apps and in their, their industry. So it's absolutely not just where you went to school, but, um, you know, Georgetown keeps stats and they say that nearly a third of black and Hispanic students with high school GPAs of 3.5 or better are actually at community colleges. So I, I think that the conversation of moving forward also has to be around strengthening the institutions where uh, black students end up, even outside of HBCUs. HBCUs cannot, as we pointed out, handle from an infrastructure perspective, every student that may want to uh, apply after George George Floyd, Howard in particular, the law school in particular, was inundated. And every year, you know, from an admissions perspective, the, the ratio of who we can admit is very low compared to the applications. But we have to be at the table also, Roland. I mean, it, when, in, in essence, even when the court is, is evaluating, you know, what factors really meet the test of strict scrutiny or not, you know, there's an underlying assumption of what is qualified. The students and parents that brought these lawsuits have their own definition based on what we've always said in the educational institution is qualified. But we have to get to the table that is defining, even in higher education, what means qualified. Is it GPA? Do we need to consider GPA? How much do we need to consider standardized tests? Do those tests need to be changed? Are we in positions of power to move the needle on what qualified even means? Jeremy, mm -hmm. your final thoughts. Well, let me, yeah, let, let me say this. Th th this is a problem created by white people and white institutions. And if they want to solve it, they have the power to solve it. The movement toward test optional uh, institutions, uh, Harvard has the capacity not to have certain entrance examinations. Um, they have the power to make the changes. We've seen a movement afoot, whether it's the SAT, whether it's the LSAT, whether it's institutions seeking the way of the GRE, they have the capacity to fix the program if they want diverse institutions. What we have to ask ourselves, I think, is the real question is, do they really want diverse institutions. And I'll tell you why I asked that. Uh, if you've read this case, you'll know that the, the justices asked the lawyers for Harvard and North Carolina several questions that they didn't have responses to, that any person on this panel could have answered in a more eloquent way. That, for me, raised a red flag. I'm going to be quite honest with you. It's almost as if they threw questions that they didn't need to throw. And when you're trained as a lawyer, you know how to do that. So something else, something else is moving here that just doesn't sit right with me. And I will say this, I do think HBCUs have the capacity to take many more students. Uh, there's an infrastructural problem, of course, and that's what happens when you have state legislatures that underfund universities like FAMU and others. So, so my, my, my major point here is, is that we shouldn't get too much in a titsy over this uh, decision. I'm more concerned about the greater effects of this and contracting and disadvantaged business enterprises and how this precedent can be used in the corporate sectors, uh, 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 sector to disenfranchise black people and how this really, in my view, is the cherry on top of the rollback in the po post-George Floyd era. I think we've reached it there. We got to be realistic about it. We got to put on some new boxing gloves and get to work. Walter, final thoughts. Well, you know, like I said, I've, I've been really trying to spend time going through it, um, and we'll see how this impacts HBCUs. I think one of the broader things we're going to have to look at, just in terms of capacity, is that how does this impact our students who want to go to graduate and professional school? Because we don't have as many of those options in terms of, mm. I mean, medical schools have a limited number of spots. Law schools have a limited number of spots. I mean, even, you know, even at a Howard, I mean, Greg, they can't take 
many more students in terms of what they have with their ability. So you have all these other law schools. And so now we've got to put more. My wife and I was were talking about this earlier. She works for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and they have this Marshall Miley Scholars Program. And so now the pipeline programs become much more important now because we have to make sure that these students can get over all these other additional hurdles that are being created for them. So we, we've got some work to do. We can't just sort of say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, that's the way it is. We've got to figure out how, because we still need our students to be able to access those places after they leave our institution. So that's, that's part of the work that will happen. All right, uh, Tiffany, Jeremy, Walter, I appreciate y'all being on the show. Damon as well. Greg, you hold tight. You're going to be there with our panel. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation when we come back. Uh, I'm going to play for y'all. 2004, August 2004, Uni Journalists of Color Convention. President George W. Bush spoke. Uh, his focus was not on what made news that day. When my question to him about affirmative action and race and legacy did make news, we're going to show you what this discussion we're having right now, I raised it to him 19 years ago. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. My early days on the road, I've learned, well, first of all, as a musician, uh, I studied not only uh, piano, but I was also drummer and percussion. I was all city percussion as well, so I was one of the best in the city on percussion. There you go. Also studied uh, trumpet, uh, cello, violin, and bass, and any other instrument I could get my hand mm -hmm. on. And, and, and with that study, I learned again what was for me. I learned to what, what it meant to do, what the instruments in the orchestra meant to each other in the relationships. Right. So that prepared me to be a leader. That prepared me to lead orchestras and to conduct orchestras. That prepared me to know, uh, to be a leader of men, they have to respect you and know that you know the music. You have to be the teacher of the music. You have to know the music better than anybody. There you go. Right, so you can't walk in unprepared. on a frequency with me, D Barnes. She's known as the Angela Davis of hip hop, Monet Smith, better known as Medusa, the gangster goddess, the undisputed queen of West Coast underground hip hop. Pop locking is really what indoctrinated me in hip hop. Mm. I, don't think, I don't even think I realized it was hip hop at that time. Right. You know, it was a, it was a, a happening. Mm -hmm. It was a moment of release. We're gonna be getting into her career, knowing her whole story and breaking down all the elements of hip hop. This week on The Frequency, only on the Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Succession. We're hearing that word pop up a lot these days as our country continues to fracture and divide. But did you know that that idea, essentially a breaking up of the USA, has been part of the public debate since long before and long after the Civil War, right up to today? On our next show, you'll meet Richard Crichton, the author of this book, who says breaking up this great experiment called America might not be such a bad thing. That's on the next Black Table, right here on the Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Jamia Pugh. I am from Coatesville, Pennsylvania, just an hour right outside of Philadelphia. My name is Jasmine Pugh. I'm also from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay right here. Folks, August 2004, President George W. Bush speaks at the Unity Journalists of Color Convention. It no longer exists, but it was a, it was a combination of all four minority journalism organizations, Native American journalists, Asian American journalists, Hispanic journalists, National Association of Black Journalists. At the time, I had just taken over as executive editor of the Chicago Defender, and I was asked to represent NABJ on that particular panel. Each one of us was supposed to get one question. Uh, and well, I didn't want just one question. Uh, and so using uh, my uh, Texas connection to President George W. Bush, uh, I asked him uh, if he would take two questions. He thought it was gonna be two questions just for me. No, I wanted two questions for the entire panel. 
What you're about to see is the result of the second question that I asked President George W. Bush. He came there, I think he was speaking about something dealing with the war or whatever. And what typically happens is Associated Press, they write the story up. They already have the, they have the copy of his speech. So as soon as he gets finished, they press the button, it goes out across the wire. Well, the question that you're about to see actually made news. Uh, the New York Times, uh, other newspapers the next day wrote about this. And so this really became the second story. And at the time, uh, the Supreme Court was looking at the, the affirmative action case out of the University of Michigan. That was the pretext of the question that I asked him 19 years ago. Watch this. You said, quote, quotas, you said, quote, quotas are an unfair system for all, unquote, with regards to your opposition to affirmative action. No, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. With regard to my opposition to quota systems. To quotas, okay. But I've never heard you speak against legacy. Now. The president of Texas A&M, Robert Gates, said that he would not use race in admissions, and then he later said he would not use legacy. If you say it's a matter of merit and not race, shouldn't colleges also get rid of legacy? And because that's not based upon yeah. merit, that's based upon if my daddy or my granddaddy went yeah, to my college. Yeah, I thought you were referring to my legacy. <laughs> that's why I allowed you to go ahead and bring it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in my case, I had to lock, knock on a lot of doors to follow the old man's footsteps. Uh, no, I, look, I, if what you're saying is, is there going to be special treatment for people? Uh, if there was, we're going to have a special exception for certain people in a system that's supposed to be fair? I, I agree. I don't think there ought to be. So the colleges should get rid of legacy? Well, I think so, yeah. I think it ought to be based upon merit, and I think it also be based upon... And I think colleges need to work hard for diversity. No, don't, make, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. You said against affirmative action is what you said. You put words in my mouth. What I am for is diversity. I just read the speech, Mr. President. What speech? In terms of when you came out against the Michigan affirmative action policy. No, I said I was against quotas. So you support affirmative action, but not I quotas. Support, I, support, I support colleges affirmatively taking action to get more minorities in their school. That's a long headline, Mr. President. I support diversity. I don't support quotas. I think quotas are wrong. I think quotas are wrong for people. But just and so be, do a lot of people. But just to be Go clear, yeah. you believe that colleges should not use legacy. I think colleges ought to use merit in order for people to get in, and I think they ought to use a merit system like the one I put out. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. Uh, folks, uh, that story went crazy. Let me tell you what happened. The New York Times had a story the next day. White parents at Harvard and Yale were blowing the phones up, demanding to know if they were going to be changing their policies to get rid of legacy. We know they didn't. Uh, we got our panel here. Let me bring in uh, Dr. Back Dr. Greg Carr, Department of Afro American Studies at Howard University, Reese Colbert, host of the Reese Colbert Show, Sirius XM Radio, Lawn Victoria Burke, uh, NNPA, Black Press of America. Um, you got, a, uh, Greg. I can tell you got a kick out of that question. Yeah, that was the great answer, man. You peeling it down. He he he, he laughed because he know that he can say that, and it don't matter because they're gonna keep it. You 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 nailed it. This is exactly. What Katanji Brown Jackson is writing about in her dissent. This is what Sonia Sotomayor is writing about in her 69 page dissent. Hers was the longest of the 237 pages. You're not getting rid of true, the true affirmative action in this country is whiteness. Let me be very clear about that. And I just want to mention one other thing. I mean, you, and you nailed him on that. And he knows they're not getting rid of it. Here's the thing, Roland, and you brought it up, brother. You, you put this thing exactly where it needs to be, exactly where it needs to be before the break. At Howard Law School, a lot of our students who come to Howard Law School, students in my classes, went to historically white schools as undergrads. They went to the Berkeleys, they went to the Harvards, they went to, and they come to Howard Law School to get that thing that they didn't get in undergraduate. 
Now, what Walter said is very important in terms of these graduate professional schools, because I have a lot of friends who are uh, parts of faculties and other places at these white, at these black schools, and we only have three black medical schools, Meharry, Morehouse School of Medicine, and Howard. I mean, you could count some others that have them in North. But the problem is this, you got a lot of non-black students at those schools because they know those schools are cheaper, they're equally, if not better, to prepare you. And you've got black students who can't get in those schools because folk then discovered how they are quality. We don't have enough schools. But what you put right in the square, I think, really is where we have to deal with this. After Baki, when affirmative action moved from, because of statutory interpretation, moved, interpretation of the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, moved from redressing past problems to diversity, our focus became diversity. And what you might see is an uptick in, and I've already seen it at Howard, as they begin to want students with the astronomical GPAs and the ability to pay, you're beginning to see students at HBCUs who are only there because they discovered that there's an equal network or better network. If you want to go to Wall Street, you don't go to Stanford undergrad, you go to Howard undergrad, and they got Wall Street, they filthy on Wall Street with that same network. But here's the problem. Those students bring some of the same attitudes toward the working class and the laboring class that they would bring if they were at Stanford or Harvard. You put it where it needs to be, uh, Roland, when we start, uh, we have to address this question of class in the black community. Because for a lot of black folk, they would love it if HBCUs became DEIUs, and they don't want to get rid of legacy either because they're four or five generations in. And just like George W. Bush giggled because you, he knew you would trap him, there are black people who would say, hey, I don't want them Negroes who I'm scared of when I walk down the street at my HBCU. I'd rather have the third or fourth generation student who was aspiring to go to the University of Chicago, but now because of this decision, will look twice at Spelman. I don't want those students at Howard because, quite frankly, I don't need that petty bourgeois static. But guess what? That number is getting higher and higher and higher. And I don't know what they do for the race except use it to their individual advantage. The, the thing that uh, I, I cracked up on there uh, with that one, um, uh, Reese, uh, was, one, he wasn't expecting that question. Uh, two, he openly admitted when he said, yeah, all the doors I had to knock on to follow my uh, dad's footsteps. George W. Bush is an absolute byproduct of white privilege, right. of legacy. That's how right. he got into Yale. That's how he got into Harvard. He didn't even come close to having the grades. And, and, and what ends up happening, parlays that into becoming owner of the Texas Rangers baseball, being in the all business, becoming governor of Texas, and becoming president of the United States. Right. And, and so what you have here, again, you have these, these Asian American students and these Asian parents, and they are so hell bent on Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Cornell, Brown, all the Ivy Leagues. I don't even know what the hell all of them are. I can't even name all of them. And so hell been on that, that they felt that, oh, no, 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 it's merit to every single one of them Asian American parents. America ain't never been about merit. That's never. the BS they always say. It has always been about the hookup, privilege, who you know, and it has been about whiteness. And the Supreme Court in his decision today did nothing to strike down the very thing that discriminated against them, which was legacy. Period. But I mean, that's that's the whole point, right, is this whole notion that the system is going to somehow be more fair when it's going to just further um, advantage those who are already given every single leg up in our society. I mean, in addition to white supremacy being the biggest crock of shit, meritocracy is the biggest crock of shit. It has nothing to do with merit, with you getting this astronomical GPA. It's whether or not your school can throw the letters AP in front of a class title, and now you get an extra grade point GPA. I did have that, you know, I benefited from that too myself, but I'm just saying there are ways to, to game the system. And the way that the white people have set this up, this set this up is that they're always going to win. And so, no, I'm sorry, Asian people, you are not any more welcome. You're not not going to have any more additional uh, ability to get into these institutions because they don't want your Asian ass there either. Just like they don't want our black asses there, they don't want y'all there either. We're already underrepresented in these institutions, supposedly with affirmative action. And so, um, you know, like I think somebody 
Tiffany had mentioned, they have the opportunity to use personal impact and personal stories and things of that nature to find a way to get around the whole notion that it's strictly by the GPA, by the SAT score or whatever scores, and they're going to continue to game the system. It's the same way that Republicans cheat. When they run out of the majority votes, they gerrymander until the, 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 the votes don't even matter. They steal, they lie, they cheat. That is the American way, not meritocracy. That's never going to change as long as whiteness is still a concept that people exalt in this country. That's not going to change for anybody. Black people, we're going to always find a way to get along and do what we got to do. This doesn't change that in the sense that we're going to make a way out of no way. But the other people who have been benefiting by the blood, sweat, and tears of Black people and the activism for Black people and off the backs of our systemic discrimination, they're going to get a wake-up call with this ruling. Real clear here, Lauren. What's, what's going to happen here? Uh, the university is going to you know, figure out how they are going to. Okay. Yeah. What kind of student body they want? It, you don't look. A lot of schools right now are not even requiring the SAT and ACT. Yeah, that's right. I think it all comes back to your book, White Fear. At the end of the day, Roland. Uh, the demographics are, are changing. Frankly, uh, we're winning. Black people are winning. You know, the, the the Barack Obama era, I think, is what touched this moment off. Uh, even though Stacey Abrams and Andrew Gillum lost, they came very close to winning. Uh, the sort of subset within a subset that's obsessed about these types of things, uh, who gets in the Harvard, who doesn't, et cetera, and so on, they are panicking in the background. Uh, they don't want to admit that people like Abigail Fisher are too stupid to get into school. They will never admit that. It really doesn't matter. Uh, to Reese's point, we make no way. Uh, we make a way out of no way. Uh, whether it's James Meredith, or Arthurine Lucy, or uh, Vivian Malone, we we will make it. We will always make it. It really doesn't matter what the rules are. If you give us a playing field and you give us, you know, what the game is we will win, and particularly when it does not involve any sort of subjective judgment. Okay, the thing about school and admissions, of course this thing is subjective. Of course, for 360 years, it's always played against us, whether it was massive resistance or, or it being illegal for black people to learn uh, uh, how to read or whatever it's been. We've overcome it, and we'll overcome it again. And it doesn't matter that John Roberts thinks that race doesn't uh, play a factor in American life, and Clarence Thomas is a fool. It really doesn't matter. In the end, we'll make it. You know, to your point, uh, Roland, you made a point about how there's so many successful people out there who have not gone to these Ivy League schools and make it anyway. Because, of course, success is not just built on uh, some degree that you have from an Ivy League school. We see so many people like Malcolm X or you know, somebody like that that they're making it because of determination and grit and intelligence and uh, and hard work and it has nothing to do with any but but if you're on the Supreme Court so many of these people are baked into this notion particularly in the Supreme Court that you have to go to a certain school to make it I mean lawyers are particularly geared for thinking that way so this isn't really a surprise but it really doesn't bother me there's a little piece of me actually that's kind of oddly glad that it happened because now we don't have to hear about this constant ridiculous idea that we're not qualified somehow because we got into a school. I mean, affirmative action, you might get into the school, but affirmative action is not going to take your test. It's not going to pass the bar for you. It's not going to get your A's and B's that you have to get when you get into the school. And there's that sort of idea in everybody's head that just getting in, of course, is the entire trick, which typically it is. Um, absolutely. All right, folks, hold tight one second. I got to go to break. We come back. Uh, I want to read what Michelle Obama posted uh, on social media. Uh, but what's really key is, I think, the last part where she actually gave a call to action to her followers. That's next on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Hey, folks, the conversation we're having right now, nobody else is having. I see thousands of y'all right now on YouTube. You're on Facebook. You're watching on Twitch, Instagram, the Black Star Network app. Um, I can't tell you enough why your support matters, okay? Uh, and, I mean, look, 
what we're doing here, no one else is doing. Look, look, I'm I'm here at Essence Festival. Um, you know what? One of my guys, one of my advertising guys, was at an event, uh, and you know a lot of these major companies announced five-year commitments, millions of dollars. But the reality is, there is no other black-owned media company that is doing the d- number of daily news and information that we're doing here at the Black Star Network. Nobody else. Byron Allen's not doing it. Black Enterprise is not doing it. Essence is not doing it. Blavity is not doing it. Urban One is not doing it. We are. Okay, we don't spend all our time focusing on sports and entertainment and gossip and hair and makeup and, and all that sort of stuff. We are talking about the issues that matter. And so we really need your support. Uh, again, well, our goal is to get 20,000 of our followers contributing on average uh, $50 a year. That's $4.19 a month, 13 cents a day. I'll tell you right now. I'm looking right here. It's more than 3,000 people uh, who are watching us uh, as we speak on our YouTube channel. And then we got people watching on the other ones. If every single one of the individuals on our YouTube channel gave 50 bucks to the show, we will raise $150,000 today. That's just real. That's just real. And so your support is critical and it matters. And so if you want to give, please do so. P.O. Box, see, check in money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. Uh, cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal or Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Um, and so, of course, uh, and again, Zell, rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Uh, let me just give a shout out uh, to the folks who've given during the show. I appreciate Ernest, Jacqueline, Sherlyn, Carrington, Kareem Brooks, uh, Norminke Holmes, Colette, uh, Charlene Perry. Um, let's see here. Donald Rush, Gerald Gilmore, Gregory Kelly, Richard McGregory, Tommy Williams, Charles Slocum, Ronald. Uh, thank you. And Antoine Brand, Tiffany Tolder. Thanks for contributing during our show. Anybody who gives will get a personal shout out uh, as we're live. Folks, I'll be back in a moment. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. On that soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, a relationship that we have to have. We're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it. That's right. We're talking about our relationship with money. And here's the thing. Our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not. The truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge. Balancing your relationship with your pocketbook. That's next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, here at Black Star Network. Hi, my name is Freddie Ricks. I'm from Houston, Texas. My name is Sharon Williams. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin. Unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? A lot of folks have been commenting today regarding the Supreme Court decision striking down the use of race in college uh, admissions. One of the uh, statements that I uh, thought was quite interesting came from former First Lady Michelle Obama. 
This is what she wrote back in college. I was one of the few black students on my campus, and I was proud of getting into such a respected school. I knew I would worked hard for it, but still, I sometimes wondered if people thought I got there because of affirmative action. It was a shadow that students like me couldn't shake, whether those doubts came from the outside or inside our own minds. But the fact is, is this, I belonged. And semester after semester, decade after decade, for more than a half a century, countless students like me showed they belonged too. It wasn't just the kids of color who benefited either. Every student who heard a perspective uh, they might not have encountered, who had an assumption challenge, who had their minds and their hearts open, gained a lot as well. It wasn't perfect, but there's no doubt that it has helped offer new ladders of opportunity for those who, throughout our history, have too often been denied a chance to show how fast they can climb. Of course, students on my campus and countless others across the country were and continue to be granted special consideration for admissions. Some have parents who graduated from the same school. Others have families who can afford coaches to help them run faster or hit a ball harder. Others go to high schools with lavish resources for tutors and extensive standardized test prep that help them score higher on college entrance exams. We don't usually question if those students belong. So often we just accept that money and power and privilege are perfectly justifiable forms of affirmative action. While kids growing up like I did are expected to compete when the ground is anything but level. So today, my heart breaks for any young person out there who's wondering what their future holds and what kinds of chances will be open to them. And while I know the strength and grit that lies inside kids who've always had to sweat a little more to climb the same ladders, I hope and I pray that the rest of us are willing to sweat a little too. Today is a reminder that we've got to do the work not just to enact policies that reflect our values of equity and fairness, but to truly make those values real in all of our schools, workplaces, and neighborhoods. If you're interested in supporting organizations who have long been advocating for this cause, check out UNCF, Hispanic Scholarship Fund, APIA Scholars, American Indian College Fund, the Dream U.S. Thurgood Marshall College Fund. That to me, uh, Reese, I think is important in that. Well, the first lady is saying, we can sit here and yell, holler, and scream, but we gotta have take action. And so for her to rec to, to millions of followers to recommend those institutions, I think is an appropriate response because the work still has to get done and the folks still gotta get educated. Absolutely. Like I said, black folks is going to find a way to make a way out of no way. But I also want to say, and I say this not in response to First Lady Michelle Obama because I have the utmost respect for her, but respectfully, let's also normalize not giving a fuck how white people think we got our asses in a room, whether that's a school, a boardroom, or any situation, because they ain't thinking two times about how we, what we think about how they got there. So, you know, this whole notion of, you know, our affirmative action was a dark cloud over black students. Who gives a damn? At the end of the day, did you did you get an advantage or not? If you did, then that's all that matters. And that's something that white people have figured out. And they do it shamelessly. They take advantage of every single leg up they have, and they turn around and say that they got that advantage because they're the best. They're the best because they're rich. They're the best because they're white. It's not about a test score with them, and it's not about um, a GPA. It's I'm white, I won, so by default, I deserved it. And I want us to normalize that attitude within our community. Whatever we can do, to get ahead. And I'm not saying step all over people, but if we're in the room, then we belong. And that's all that has to be proven to anybody. So yes, let's do this call to action, but we also need to change. And we've talked about this throughout the show, the mentality that goes into wanting acceptance, wanting to prove that we deserve and that we belong. We don't have to prove shit to anybody. Just like the same people we so-called trying to prove ourselves to don't feel like they have to prove anything to us. That's right. See, that was a thing for me. Uh, that was a thing for me, Greg. You know, Clarence Thomas, that was always his deal. Part of this thing is that 
you know, his hatred affirmative action because he felt like what the white kids were saying about me when I was at Yale and that cheapened my degree. Yeah, but you wrote that damn elitist ass degree to the Supreme Court. So stop Hello? fronting. And the thing for me is, I'm, I'm like, I'm like Reese Gregg. I didn't give a damn what no white kid at Texas A&M thought. Here's the crazy part. I got, I've said stuff. I got white folks, white folks who was, they were trying to call me affirmative action baby when I was at CNN. And you know what? I wasn't about to sit here and go, how dare you call me the affirmative action baby? I've done this, this, this. All I simply did was what Della Reese said in the Hall of Nights. Kiss my entire <laughs> ass. Period. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I mean, you know, although I must say something Professor Levitt said before he, he, he logged off about this, the impact of this, something that I, I heard Professor Angie Porter who's over at American University say today in response. There's the legal implications and then the real world implications. Of course, higher education is one thing, but these corporations, these companies take their cue in terms of uh, affirmative action from these types of decisions. So now everybody who's brushing up their resume, who's going in for an entry-level position or internship, needs to be very nervous now about these places that now are going to take this and say, oh, that's the signal? Well, that's why Biden said, don't you corporations do this, because he absolutely knows they're going to do it. Um, but this not giving a damn is really central. Clarence Thomas is a deeply traumatized man. His blackness is drawn from what he thinks white people think about blackness. The way he talks, mm. color of his skin, the approach, and it's and it's and you know that's why we talked with Corey Robin, who wrote the book The Enigma of Clarence Thomas on the black table. He is a black nationalist, but his blackness is a figment of the white imagination. He thinks he's helping black people, absolutely, and that's basically just showed who he wrote into the uh, the Supreme Court. But anyway, it's a good article in the recent issue of New York Magazine about those two classes, Jane Thomas. But Reese, when you talk about not giving a damn, that's critical, and and that was a lovingly kind of corrective to the first lady. Because in a generation before Michelle Obama went to Princeton, after they became co-ed, Sonia Sotomayor graduated from Princeton, class of 76. One of the first places she came after she was sworn in as an associate justice of Supreme Court was Howard Law School. And I sat in the auditorium with those law students and listened to her say that she wanted to do something about the class elitism on the Supreme Court. Because everybody's either Harvard or Yale, they're either Catholic or Jewish, they went to these ex exclusive schools, and she wants to diversify the clerks. The first question that she was asked that day was by a young man that said, I want to be a clerk, so what do I need to do? And she gave an excellent answer about being able to read and write beautifully and loving the law and all that. She still ain't hired no HBCU clerks, to my knowledge. Guess who ain't hired no HBCU clerks in her first term either? Katanji Brown Jackson, all Harvard. My point is this. Michelle Obama wanted something coming out of the South Side of Chicago, and she got it, to Reese's point, at Princeton. She got access to the privilege, the very privilege that she balanced in that message by saying, here are all the institutional supports for places where people don't have the privilege that you should support. But I'm going to end with this. There's a certain gaslighting among the black elite who appoint themselves as proxies for the race, and in fact, you don't see them do a whole lot for the race. Because the last I checked, Roman, your black-owned, black-operated, black-as-hell content network has yet to have the sit-down with either the former first lady or the former president of the United States, who are so rah-rah about race, except when it comes to sharing some of that Netflix money. Or so. So, I mean, see, so I'm always a little wary of them Negroes to get in the room and don't bring nobody else with them. I'm going to stop right there. Well, look, I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I was uh, I attended the um, uh, the Global Black Economic Forum that Essence Ventures put on uh, today, uh, and was here. It was in the Four Seasons Hotel, and uh, the, the Ambassador of the United Nations spoke. Uh, again, Vice President spoke. I think it's taking place tomorrow. Uh, and um, and there were first of all, it wasn't it was it wasn't. I don't even know if there was registration. It may have been. It may have been a cost associated with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was sitting there, and I was you know I was looking around the room, and um, and the number of people in the room who I knew, I talked to over the years, and folk who were working in corporate America, and the conversation was good. It was a black economic forum, and even when the vice president was speaking, I was remarking to the guy sitting next to me. They were talking about oh economic opportunities in Africa and whatever, and I turned to him. I'm say I said ninety five percent of the black owned businesses in America do less than five million dollars in revenue. 
95 percent. If you look at the executive leadership council, the black, the black, the black corporate group, uh, their own internal study shows how many of those black folks are booted out of corporate America before they reach 60. Booted out. He, he sort of hit the glass ceiling. And so, so, so to the point that Greg, that you were making and just sort of just how I, how I absolutely feel. My whole deal is if you become one of, one of those elite blacks and you're operating in rarefied air, the question is, how are you connecting with those of us not at 30,000 feet? How, how are you saying I'm going to bring people along with me? I say this all the time. Uh, if you're t if you're in a company, I just don't want to see the black people who you have in executive positions. I want to know who getting the contracts, who's getting the money, who's getting the catering contracts, who's getting the transportation contracts, who's get. See, th th that's the whole deal. A at some point, if we're going to be sitting here talking about, Lauren, how do we move in privileged circles? How do we operate in el elite institutions? Who's benefiting from us attending a Harvard or Yale, are the individuals benefiting or we're benefiting as a collective? Are people truly ma you maximizing the opportunities uh, to open up new opportunities? I say this all the time to the black people who work at these ad agencies. What are you actually doing for black owned media? Or are you just simply there to check boxes? And so that's what, what this whole thing boils down to. Uh, and so, uh, to yeah, Greg, we, we, we didn't get uh, interview with the president when his book came out. We didn't get one with the first lady when her book came out. And even in the last year of the White House, the first lady told me specifically, out of her own mouth, two consecutive years, that she was going to do a sit-down interview with me uh, before they got to the White House, and it never happened. Uh, so I, I don't know why, but my whole deal is I tried. I was available. They never called. Ain't like folk didn't have my number. So that, that to me, Lauren, we as African Americans... And I'm going to bring Dr. King here. Clarence Jones said in his book, King met with him, and Clarence was like, yo, I'm good. I'm making money as a corporate attorney. I'm all right. King gave a speech the next day, and Clarence Jones said King was basically talking to him, saying, uh, just because you're doing well in your, in, in your field uh, don't mean that you can't help the rest of our people. That really has to be our state of mind. And so that's how we must approach, I think, this and also other issues. Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's deep. I mean, there's so much to say there. I, I just know in my experience in all the places that I've worked, uh, whether it's ABC or USA Today or whatever, it wasn't the boule crowd that was helpful to me. It was typically people who were blue collar, who had to work their way up, that went to some community college and then transferred after two years into another school and had the life experience that sort of taught them that I got to help other people. Now, sometimes it's somebody in the boule crowd. Sometimes it is somebody from Harvard. You just never know in life. But uh, what I find is that's generally not the case. But I mean, us working as a collective has always been a huge challenge. It's something that we need to deal with. Uh, you know, to get back to a few things about this Michelle Obama statement that you put up before, I mean, you know, as I think everybody on the panel knows, she went to Princeton, uh, which is like probably less than 5% black. Uh, to echo Reese's sentiments once again. I mean, this idea that you're going to make me feel inferior, you're going to make me feel like I shouldn't be in the room or I'm going to be thinking about what other people, I really could not give an F. I really could not. Half the time, we're the smartest person in the room in a place like Harvard and Princeton because we got to be perfect to get in there. They get yeah. in on legacy. They get in on athletics. They get in on some nonsense. They're a donor, whatever. Trump's freaking uh, son-in-law, whatever. So the 5% of black kids you see walking around on a Harvard Princeton College campus, they're like the cream of the crop in the entire country. They're the ones that get all the scholarships. They're the ones that busted their ass, got the perfect freaking SAT score. And then you're going to make me feel like I shouldn't be here. You've got to be out of your mind. So what Reese said earlier is the perfect thing. And, you know, Clarence Thomas, the, the idea, the absurdity of Clarence Thomas lecturing people uh, on, on anything. Uh, but, you know, he, he's, it's, at the end of the day, it's Stockholm syndrome and insecurity. He wants so badly to be liked by white people. He wants that mm. so badly, and you can never get it. It's the Adolf Caesar speech in a soldier story at the end of the day. They still hate you no matter what you do. You got to do your thing. And Clarence Thomas is just a sad example 
of what happens when you grow up in a society, uh, in, in a situation, in a specific place that doesn't like you, and you know that, and you don't figure out that, you know, uh, your confidence and your self-ability to come through that uh, has got to ignore your environment around you. I think it's sad in a way. I think, you know, I, I think it's difficult. I, you know, I sometimes think about Clarence Thomas, and I feel sorry for him, that he doesn't have the self-awareness about who he is as an individual, and he let society make him feel inferior. And you see it in his statement today. Shout out to KBG, Katanji Brown Jackson, for lighting his ass up hot on everything that he said. So there you go. <laughs> uh, Got to go to a break. Uh, we come back. I want to talk about that because, folks, if y'all have actually read any of this, <laughs> it was like... <laughs> It was like, look, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, she basically wrote this mother. That's pretty much what. And Clarence Thomas was hot. Clarence Thomas was mad at this sister because she went at his throat. We'll discuss that next right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Next on the Black Table with me, Greg Carr. The enigma of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. What really makes him tick? And what forces shaped his view of the world, the country, and black America? The answer, I'm pretty sure, will shock you. And he says, you know, people think that I'm anachronistic. I am. I want to go backwards in time in order to move us forward into the future. He's very upfront about this. We'll talk to Corey Robin, the man who wrote the book that reveals it all. That's next on The Black Table, only on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, I'm sure you've heard that saying that the only thing guaranteed is death and taxes. The truth is that the wealthy get wealthier by understanding tax strategy. And that's exactly the conversation that we're going to have on the next Get Wealthy, where you're going to learn wealth hacks that help you turn your wages into wealth. Taxes is one of the largest expenses you ever have. You really got to know how to manage that thing and get that under control so that you can build wealth. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Up next on The Frequency with me, Dee Barnes. She's known as the Angela Davis of hip hop, Monet Smith, better known as Medusa, the gangster goddess, the undisputed queen of West Coast underground hip hop. Pop locking is really what indoctrinated me in hip hop. Mm. I, don't think, I don't even think I realized it was hip hop at that time. Right. You know, it was a, it was a, a happening. Mm -hmm. It was a moment of release. We're gonna be getting into her career, knowing her whole story and breaking down all the elements of hip hop. This week on The Frequency, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. I don't say, I don't play Sammy, but I could. Or I don't play Obama, but I could. I don't do Stallone, but I could do all that. And I am here with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. Man, let me tell y'all something. A lot of times when you're reading these Supreme Court decisions, your eyes just sort of gloss over. But man, rarely do we get to see these justices duke it out. Judge Katandi Brown Jackson, uh, she wrote uh, this here, and uh, it may not be uh, if we have the full control room, but she said, the majority and concurring opinions rehearse this court's idealistic vision of racial equality from Brown forward with appropriate lament for past indiscretions. But the race-linked gaps that the law aided by this court previously founded and fostered, which indisputably define our present reality, are strangely absent and do not seem to matter. With let them eat cake obliviousness, today the majority pulls the ripcord and announces color blindness for all by legal fiat. But deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. And having so detached itself from this country's actual past and present experiences, the court has now been lured into interfering with the crucial work 
that UNC and other institutions of higher learning are doing to solve America's real world problems. No one benefits from ignorance. Although formal race linked legal barriers are gone, race still matters to the lived experiences of all Americans in innumerable ways. And today's ruling makes things worse, not better. The best that can be said of the majority's perspective is that it proceeds, parentheses, ostrich like, from the hope that preventing consideration of race will end racism. But if that is, is, is its motivation, the majority proceeds in vain. If the colleges of this country are required to ignore a thing that matters, it will not just go away. It will take longer for racism to leave us. And ultimately, ignoring race just makes it matter more. Y'all, she was in the pocket uh, today. Um, can you say Clarence Thomas was a little hot? <laughs> L- let me just read for you. Uh, uh, l- let me just read for you um, uh, what uh, he, he, John Roberts w- w- was so mad. Uh, he, Clarence couldn't fight his own fight, so John Roberts had to come defend him. Uh, he writes, that is a remarkable view of the judicial role, remarkably wrong, lost in, lost in the false pretense of judicial humility at the dissent espouses is a claim to power so radical, so destructive that it required a second founding to undo. Justice Harlan knew better. One of the dissent's decrees, the view in, in view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. That was the Plessy B. Ferguson decision. John Roberts literally used the Plessy dissent to try to slap down this black woman on the Supreme Court. That's right. That's right. Really? Really, y'all? Now, 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 now let, me, let me find... Let me, let, so I, I got to read to y'all how clueless Clarence uh, Thomas is. So, so check this out. He goes, Yet Justice Jackson would replace the second founder's vision with an organizing principle based on race. In fact, on her view, almost all of life's outcomes may be so unhesitatingly uh, ascribed to race. This is so, she writes, because of statistical disparities among different racial groups. Even if some whites have a lower household net worth than some blacks, what matters to Justice Jackson is that the average white household has more wealth than the average black household. By a long shot. Okay, that wasn't his opinion. This, he writes, y'all, this is what Clarence Thomas said. This lore is not and has never been true. Even in the segregated South where I grew up, individuals were not the sum of their skin color. (laughs) Boy, bye. Then as now, not all disparities are based on race. Not all people are racist and not all differences between individuals are ascribable to race. (laughs) Put simply, the the fate of abstract categories of wealth statistics is not the same as the fate of a given set of flesh and blood human beings. He's quoting Thomas Sowell. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Worse still, Justice Jackson uses her broad observations about statistical relationships between race and select measures of health, wealth, and well-being to label all blacks as victims. No, she didn't. Her desire to do so is unfathomable to me. I cannot deny the great accomplishments of black Americans. Lord, now, let me, uh, while I'm looking for this, Greg, uh, 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 help me out here. Uh, yes, sir. What page? What page you can get? Judge Jackson. Page numbers on the PDF. I, 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 what page um, is you I, yeah, I don't have a page number up. No. Okay. What, not, I'm, not what I'm looking. What I'm looking for. What I'm looking for right now with with Brown Jackson is when she made y'all. She said. Put no 103. Put no 103. I think what you're I'm, I'm just going. I, 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 I'm just. I'm just going to paraphrase it, Greg. When she said. This boy's arguments are so stupid. Uh, yeah. I don't even have enough time to to blow them out the water. Yes, well, she literally same, said bro. his straw man his straw man arguments. Yes, 
You look, you look, I think you probably look at, I'm sure you are, in footnote 103 of her concurrence, I'm sorry, of her, her, her uh, dissent, she destroys him. This is very important. And again, and again, listen, y'all, Black Star Network, nowhere else. I just want, I just want to just pause here and make this observation, Roland. I know some of y'all think Rachel Maddow, Maddow is brilliant. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. I'm not sure. But where, what in the history of black news media, where have you seen a host read from Supreme Court opinion and dismantle it in black media? I'm not, this, ain't, this ain't the hee-hee-ha-ha reality television. This is a different thing going on right now. And I also want to thank you, Roland, by the way, because— not only were we able to interview Corey Robin for the Black Table, we interviewed Professor Kern Roosevelt at the University of Pennsylvania, who wrote a book on that second reconstruction. Only on the Black Star Network are you going to get mm. behind the noise to deal with what Ketanji Brown Jackson is dealing with. In footnote 103, what she says is Clarence Thomas made up an opinion right. in my name and then attacked it. So she says Justice Thomas's prolonged attack, anti at pages 49 to 55. Response to a dissent I did not write in order to assail an admissions program that is not the one UNC is crafted. She called that MF is chasing a pink elephant. She said, so what is the pink elephant? A pink elephant argument is when you say, don't think of a pink elephant, and all you can think of is pink elephants. She says Clarence Thomas made up a concept of race in his mind that he's obsessed with that doesn't exist in reality, and then he tried to make me up to attack me, and then she dismantles him. Clarence Thomas is sick. And Katanji Brown Jackson was on him like Omar was on everybody in the wire. She brought the pump shotgun for his ass. I, I think that's probably what you, I think might be that footnote you're looking for. <laughs> footnote 103 is on page 20. Oh, no, no, no. no, no, no right. I, 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 love, I love this here, Reese. She says, just as Thomas ignites too many, uh, too, well, look, just as Thomas ignites too many more straw men to list or fully extinguish here. <laughs> the takeaway is that those the takeaway is that those who demand that no one think about race, quote, a classic pink elephant paradox, refuse to see much less solve for the elephant in the room. The race link disparities that continue to impede achievement of our great nation's full potential. Worse still, by insisting that obvious truths be ignored, that they prevent our problem solving institutions from directly addressing the real import and impact of social racism and government imposed racism, anti at 55 Thomas J. concurring, thereby deterring our collective progression toward becoming a society where race no longer matters. I mean, she was like, boy, you just offering straw man arguments that don't amount to nothing, and I just don't even have enough time to extinguish them here. <sighs> I mean, it's like, you know, we all get into these arguments on social media with somebody who just don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And it's just like, we aren't even in the same realm of the conversation. You are on some whole other shit that I don't even have time to properly respond to. But I just have to say, I would be remiss if I didn't say this. Fuck the founding farmers. This whole uh, fa founding fathers. This whole notion that like, oh, we're going to get to founding fathers. They own slaves. Fuck them. Fuck them and their right. stupid ass vision. This was not a race blind country. This was not equality for all country unless you buy into their notion that enslaved people are not in fact human beings. So I, I just, it, 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 it just, it's absurd and it's gaslighting how these white supremacist justice, including Justice Thomas, try to sit up there and act like they are showing deference to the notion of color blindness by invoking people that fucking did not see black people people as human beings, let alone women as human beings. That's a whole nother story, too. So I, I just think that we're having a discussion on the terms and with notions that were bullshit from the very beginning. And to carry them forward is just delusional, but it's intentional. It's working as design. It's going to have the impact that they wanted to have. 
The only thing is there's going to be collateral damage with people that they typically wouldn't want to do harm to, which is not black people. It's the non-white or non-white and non-black people and the women who are white who have benefited greatly from the strides and from the kinds of protections that affirmative action has put in place. But let's all be clear. Black people still had to work 10 times as hard. I remember when I was applying for jobs, moving to the DMV, I took my race off of applications, and I immediately started getting more, um, you know, more more calls back because I bought into the notion of diversity and equity. I'm black. That's gonna help me. She. It sure the fuck didn't. As soon as I didn't know if I was a black girl, I got all the damn calls. And so we know as black people in this country, when we're going for a job, when we fill out those applications, if you check black, you definitely not getting ahead, despite what these white propagandists and racists have been trying to tell us and shove down our throat about how diversity and inclusion is disproportionately impacting us, it hasn't. So go to hell. You know, uh, you know, Lauren, I, you know, Rishi, she, she, you know, she nails it. And look, we know it. And you know, what's that fool, Vivek, whatever, he, he was running for oh. running Republican. I don't oh, my know, God. For, he ain't running for president. <laughs> he did some video today talking about, oh, there's no systemic racism. I'm like, fool, shut up. Recent made the point there. Yeah, you take, look, study, blind, colorblind studies have been done. Exact same resume, white sounding name, black sounding name, the white person got 50% more callbacks than the black person. So let's sit here and not sit here and play this silly little game. We know what these cats are doing. This is where we got to learn to call it what it is. And I got to go ahead here and, and, and go there. Anybody who's watching me right now, and anybody who's listening to me right now, if you chose to vote for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton, you can kiss my black ass. <laughs> <laughs> because all of those folks who got caught up in Bernie, Bernie didn't get the nomination, ain't vote for Hillary, guess what? That's how we got today's decision. How about that? Hillary beats, if Hillary beat, and let me be perfectly clear, Hillary wasn't no perfect candidate, ain't no perfect candidate, but I know she damn well was better and smarter than Trump. I know damn well she would have never appointed a Neil Gorsuch, a Brett Kavanaugh, a Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. And so again, all y'all folk who commenting today on this decision, and if you kept your sorry ass at home, and if you didn't register, and if you did vote, and you voted for Trump over Hillary, kiss my ass. You sound like the dude, uh, Latino dude, who used to clean, uh, he used to do some do some yard stuff or whatever, I can't remember what he did. He clipped some inside, I don't know, my wife hired him, I don't know. And so, oh, he was a big ass Trumper. Oh man, he loved him some Donald Trump. Until Donald Trump started deporting that ass. And when Donald <laughs> Trump started going off on them damn immigrants and building the wall, Oh, it's amazing how his tone changed on his Facebook page. And guess what? That's why we use hashtag, we tried to tell you. So again, if you one of those folks who complaining after the fact, just like all them white women were whining outside the Supreme Court in the Dobbs decision, shut your ass up because today <laughs> is what happens when you do not vote. That's real. Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I do think about Robbie Mook today. <laughs> I think about Robbie Mook a lot today, uh, because it is the uh, it is the moment uh, created by Hillary Clinton losing. Um, you know, the irony of this whole Clarence Thomas, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson uh, boxing match that we saw that she really won in the first round uh, is that you have Clarence Thomas arguing that somehow, you know, race shouldn't matter. And, of course, so sort of disregarding history, disregarding um, everything that has to do with black history. He just has this sort of contempt. It's kind of strange. It always sort of rears its head at these moments, and it's really strange. And the fact that he was so motivated by what she said, it's, it's just an ultimate example of a hit dog hollering. But the ultimate irony of it is that the reason that he is on the U.S. Supreme Court 
is the very thing mm -hmm. that he is arguing against. Mm -hmm. He, in fact, is a quota. He is not even affirmative yep. action. Anybody who believes that he's qualified to be there is joking. I mean, this man never speaks, he never says anything, and then all of a sudden he does say something, what motivates him is something like this. It's usually race. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a shame. You know, I, I just cannot wait until he's gone. I cannot wait until he's off the court. He's exactly what uh, what a lot of these sort of racist right-wing Republicans love. They always find some black clown to sort of do their bidding, uh, and they have found it in him. And he's dangerous. He, he's just dangerously stupid. And the reason that he was angry today is that he got he got smoked, and he got smoked red hot. And it's uh, good to see because you know. Uh, Sotomayor is the other big player in this game. Uh, Sotomayor really brings it. I don't think Kagan brings it as hard. And by the way, Kagan's the other one that's never had a black law clerk, clerk in, in history. Mm -hmm. I, we should recheck that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Katanji is really. I know a lot. Of, we we heard a lot of stuff about Katanji. Remember when she got nominated? She might be too conservative. She might be corporate. She went to Harvard. This and that. Well, she's showing up big time. In these, in these opinions, because uh, I can't wait to read the rest of it. But what I've already read already shows me that this was a great pick. This was a great moment for, for President Biden. Mm -hmm. um, indeed, indeed. Um, folks, I got to do a quick break. Uh, when we come back, uh, we do have to pay homage uh, to Christine Ferris, the last <laughs> sibling of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She passed away today, today at the age of 95. Uh, we'll uh, tell our story next. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause, too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196. Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, I'm sure you've heard that saying that the only thing guaranteed is death and taxes. The truth is that the wealthy get wealthier by understanding tax strategy. And that's exactly the conversation that we're gonna have on the next Get Wealthy, where you're going to learn wealth hacks that help you turn your wages into wealth. Taxes is one of the largest expenses you ever have. You really gotta know how to manage that thing and get that under control so that you can build wealth. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Latasha from the A. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
Christine Farris passed away today at the age of 95. She was the last living sibling of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She was more than just uh, his sister. She was the first child of Martin Luther King Sr. and Alberta Williams King. She earned a bachelor's degree in economics from Spelman College and later master's degrees in social foundations of education and special education from Columbia University. She was a founding board member of, a, of the King Center, founded by Dr. King's wife, Coretta Scott King, in 1968. Uh, that same year, they began a, a memorial library documenting Dr. King's journey in the civil rights movement. She was one of the longest serving tenured professors at Spelman College, teaching at the All Women's Institution for more than five decades. Was also one of the longest serving members of Ebenezer Baptist Church, where her grandfather, father, and brother served as pastors. Uh, the family's going to hold a news conference tomorrow at the King Center at 11 a.m. Eastern. Ferris spoke at the dedication in 2011 of the MLK uh, Monument in Washington, D.C. I stand today as the person who knew Martin Luther King Jr. longer than anyone now alive. In fact, I was there in our home the day that he was born on January 15, 1929. He was my little brother, and I watched him grow and develop into a man who was destined for a very special kind of greatness. It's been quite a journey from that cold January day more than 82 years ago on down to today when I first laid my eyes on my baby brother. Now I'm standing here alongside an African-American president at the dedication of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial on the National Mall. During my life, I witnessed a baby become a great hero to humanity who provides hope and inspiration for freedom-loving people everywhere. So I just want to say to all the young people coming up, great dreams can come true, and America is a place where you can make it happen. And I know that our president will agree with me on this. It wasn't far from here where my brother Martin told America about his great dream for our country. On this day, 48 years ago, the dream of justice, equality, and brotherhood he shared with us on that sweltering August afternoon. It's really the heart and soul of the American dream. It's what this country must always be about so we can light the way forward to a new era of peace and prosperity for all people in all nations. And I remember another lovely afternoon in 1983 when another president of the United States signed into law a bill to name my brother's birthday a federal holiday. That, too, was a day of hope and healing. I don't think my brother's legacy could get much larger. But I was wrong because here I am overjoyed and humbled to see this great day when my brother Martin takes his symbolic place on the National Mall. <laughs> on this National Mall near America's greatest presidents, including Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, and Franklin Roosevelt. This is just overwhelming. 
My brother was never one to seek great honors. In fact, he was self-effacing, and he was amazed and humbled to receive the Nobel Prize for Peace back in 1964. I want to thank the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity for having the vision, commitment, and determination to conceive this project and to see it through. By honoring Martin Luther King Jr. with such a wonderful statue on the National Mall, you have ensured that his legacy will provide a source of inspiration for people from all over the world for generations to come. My brother was an alpha himself, and he was deeply proud of his fraternity brothers when they came to the aid of our nonviolent freedom struggle again and again with urgently needed contributions and volunteer support. And now, against all odds, you have built this beautiful monument which brings honor to our country and hope to coming generations. And in closing, I want to thank each of you for joining us today. Your presence is also an affirmation of my brother's legacy and the great blessings of diversity in America. Let this wonderful day mark another step toward the fulfillment of the dream. And let all hearts be joined together as we move forward into the future, united and determined to create the beloved community in America and throughout the world. I thank you. One of the things that will often happens, um, Lauren, when um, you are the sister or the brother of a prominent person, people only equate you as this. Uh, but so many people, uh, women who've gone through Spelman, have talked about the importance of Christine uh, Farris uh, on their education. No, absolutely. And uh, I think I met her at the groundbreaking uh, uh, not that ceremony, but the one before it. I, I guess it must have been before 2006. Really nice lady, <laughs> very nice lady. And uh, I was really sad to see uh, that bulletin with everything else that was going on. I was really sad to see that. Now, I tell you what, Reese, uh, I think uh, she probably gave Dorothy Hype a run for her money with them <laughs> church hats. Every time I saw, every, every time I saw her, she always. Every time I saw her, she was always dressed to the nines. Always. Yes. Just absolutely stunning. Um, and I, I love that you mentioned that because, you know, black women are so multifaceted. We could be powerful and dynamic and look damn good in the process. So I'm okay. glad that you are uh, paying homage to her and her uh, in invaluable contributions beyond just simply, and I don't say simply in a, in a pejorative way, but beyond just being the sibling of the great late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Greg. I mean, I'm, I'm almost overcome, Roland. Again, this is the importance of this network. This is the importance of this show. And this is the importance of you as a journalist who has got both feet planted firmly in our community. Um, when the President of the United States spoke at Ebenezer recently, and Sister Bernice King was there and talking, and then Professor Ferris came in in her wheelchair, which she only used in the last couple of years. You know, it's like time stops. Um, these last couple of days I've been in Atlanta, I spent part of yesterday and today at the King Center. And of course the news came today. And just sitting there with the women and men who are the park rangers for the National Park Service, who take care of the original, well, not the original, A.D. Williams, her grandfather, uh, built that church, Ebenezer Baptist Church, started in, in, erected in 1914. There was a young sister today who works there, and she was talking about how Professor Ferris 
was coming to her birthday in that church, even as she continued to be a member of the huge new uh, sanctuary across the street, Ebenezer, where, of course, Reverend Warnick is the pastor, our friend, brother. She said that, you know, students from the Atlanta University Center would perform at the Legacy Church, Ebenezer. And to a person, the sisters who run the bookstore next to the King home, the, the brothers who work outside and maintain the King campus, the King Center campus, they talked about Christine Ferris. You know, this sister who spent, as you say, five decades on the campus of Spelman College, listening to students at Spelman, listening to knowing that she took that job in 1958 to teach freshman reading and expanded that literacy quest over decades, not just Spelman students, but to many others. Uh, condolences to her children, uh, to her niece and nephews. Condolences to everyone who lie, lives that she touched. Uh, her husband, Isaac Ferris, and of course, Roland, you know better than I do, brother, because again, you were just down here, you've been over there many times. Auburn Avenue, Isaac Ferris, her husband, who works for the Atlanta Daily World. When you see Christine Ferris, you don't just see an individual, you see institutions and the power of institutions to shape lives and to continue to shape lives. This, if she were white, this would be all over all of the press everywhere. But because she is black, it falls to the Black Star Network to do what you do every time one of our giants makes transition, which is to pause to keep passing of a giant. So I wish I could be there tomorrow for the family press conference, but in a way it doesn't matter because her legacy lives in us. And thank you for doing this, brother, as always. Christine King Ferris passed away the age of 95, and so we certainly honor her. Uh, Lauren, Reese, Greg, I appreciate it. I want to thank uh, our uh, uh, president and legal panel that was on with us as well. Great conversation. And again, a conversation you're not going to get anywhere else. If you want to understand why black-owned media matters, and, and let me be real clear here, kill the music. What I'm trying to get you to understand is this is not just about, again, entertainment and sports and things along those lines. We have to have news and information in our community. We must be uh, enlightened and educated uh, about what is going on. And that's why we do what we do. And so uh, it trips me out when I see these fools, man, hey, Roland Martin, you're always begging for money. But it's amazing. They don't say nothing when NPR does it. They don't say nothing when PBS does it. Yet here we are. Uh, trying to walk in the footsteps uh, of Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells Barnett uh, and John H. Johnson and uh, Robert Abbott and Charlotta Bass and all of uh, the historic uh, of folks who've been the black press operating in the 21st century. What we do on this show, folks, nobody else is doing. I'm telling you this. Byron Allen has two hours of news a day on his network, The Grio. Two. We got five. My show is two hours a day. Faraji Muhammad is two hours a day. And then we have a weekly show. So whether it's Deborah Owens, Jackie Hood Martin, whether it's Greg Carr, whether it's Stephanie Humphrey, um, whether it's D Barnes, y'all, that's five hours of black owned news and information every single day. That's why Black Star Network matters. So first and foremost, we got um, we, literally we're almost at 1.1 million subscribers on YouTube. We need you downloading our app. Uh, we own it. We control it. And that's critically important. Uh, so please do so. Uh, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Your dollars matter. Please give to uh, us. I can't tell you how critical this is. Uh, I, look, I know I'm the one who has to pay the bills. I know when I have to make a cut or, or not spend on certain things to conserve money. And so your resources matter. Our fan base matters. Our monthly expenses for everything, y'all, is $195,000 per month. And that's staff, and that's salaries, and that's, uh, that's our rent. That's our, the live view unit I'm using. That's cameras, and that's everything. And so the cost is real. And so when you contribute, you absolutely are helping us keep these uh, doors open and allowing us to keep telling our story and being unapologetic every single day. Okay, today, y'all, we had black law professors from Howard University, 
from Florida A&M University. The law is committed for civil rights under law. Former president of Philander Smith Dillard, Greg Carr from Howard University, a ABC, NBC, CBS, they not going to have that many black legal scholars on for the whole week. We had them in one hour. So send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Uh, Dataless Construction just sent 10 bucks uh, saying keep, uh, you know, keep reporting. Gene sent $45 for the show. We also have uh, Daryl Andre Fun who sent 25 bucks. Gilbert Ross sent 10 bucks. Uh, we got um, Stacy Sims sent 50 bucks. Uh, Stephen Love sent 50. Cl Clarita Forbes sent 20. Uh, Larney Richardson sent 100. Um, Betty Brown sent 50. Michael Boyd Harris sent 20. Uh, let's see here. LeGrant Elvin, 50. Uh, Stephanie Bush uh, sent 55. Charlie Stokes sent 50. Yvette Fennell sent 50. Nate sent 100. Joseph Reed III sent 50. Tanya Mormon sent 50. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Der Derek Blanche sent five bucks. Um, and again, y'all, Cornell Thomas sent $10. That five and $10 matter. Ira Button, 25. Nancy, uh, Nancy sent uh, 50 bucks saying, uh, love your show. Um, let's see here. Pr Priscilla G sent 100. Lawanda Rivers, Philip Gary, uh, Yvette Mazone, uh, Gloria Langley, Sylvia Peraza, Hiram Etienne, Robert Blackwell, Jesse Benefield, Delilah Collins, Devante Piguet, uh, Shirley Simpson, Keisha Sancho, Laurent Blakely sent $1, said, love your YouTube content. Y'all, that $1 is just as important as $100. Audra James, Brian Hall, Iris Lee, Jermaine Smith, Sherlane Carrington, all of those folks, uh, uh, Norminke uh, Holmes, uh, let's see here, Colette, Charlene Perry, uh, Scott, Va uh, Scott Von Rutten, um, I appreciate that. Yo, I'm telling you, all of this absolutely matters. Uh, James uh, Fennell just sent 20. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I think I missed Terrell Foster, Bradrick Bennett, um, Herbie Holland, Russell, Tracy Dupree. Y'all, these people literally giving as I am talking. Uh, Russell, $25, great work. Valerie Saunders just sent $50 in. Uh, who did I just miss? Leon Rousen, uh, Keith Lewis, 06, uh, Gloria Langley, Deborah Amos, Stephanie Bush. Uh, let's see, Paul Gamby. Uh, all of those people, yeah, I'm talking about y'all, as I'm talking, people are literally uh, sending in uh, money. Pa again, Paul Gamby just sent this. Um, Let's see here. Uh, uh, Lomax sitting in 50 bucks. Uh, thank you for being black media. Uh, and so uh, Gregory just sent 50. Chris Young just sent 25. Y'all, I'm only going to do this for 60 more seconds. We're, we're way over time. We normally don't go that long. Uh, Chris Young just sent 25 bucks for RMU 2023. Uh, and so... Uh, and so you're seeing uh, so, uh, Salte Dean uh, 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 just sent. And so you're now understanding Vincent Williams. I appreciate uh, that four dollars. And so, uh, folks, all of this matters. Uh, we are doing the work. And so that's what's important. And so we appreciate Louis sent twenty dollars. Y'all, I'm only doing this for thirty more seconds, and then I got to go. I got to get out of here. Uh, Charles Berry sent a hundred dollars. Uh, thanks a bunch. Y'all can give when the show is over. I saw y'all giving on YouTube. I saw folks giving twenty and fifty and forty dollars. I thank all of you on YouTube as well. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, who've been supporting us, y'all. This is why we do the work because trust me, if we don't build it and if we don't do the work. Ain't nobody else going to do it. And I am not interested in asking for somebody else's permission to cover our news and cover our stories the way we want it to be done. Folks, that's it. I'll see you tomorrow from New Orleans. I'm Roland Martin. Holla! Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches! A real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black, I love y'all. We have now, we have to keep this going.
The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?